But apart from these formalities, first of all, um, good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you. Today, uh, we gather an occasion of a relatively small historical workshop on a sub subject which, um, it seems to me at least, is of central importance. The title of our meeting is Polycentrical Perspectives on Global History, New Interpretations of Time, Space and Society. Our current interest, and with our I mean uh, ESIC, uh, the historical German-Italian Historical Institutes, our interest in this field of research builds on various initiatives. The Annali, the yearbook of our institute, is one of them. Its latest issue came out last week and it contains several articles by authors who are present in our electronic roundtable. There is more to come next year, hopefully under much better circumstances. Thus, we plan to organize our Settimana di Studi, our study week in September 2022 with a focus on the regional dimensions of globalizing and deglobalizing tendencies over a long span of time. Furthermore, there will be a series of tabula ovale roundtable discussions to look more closely into the same problem. Today, we will open the first round of these discussions, and I'm very grateful for all participants, especially the speakers who uh, are with us today. But before we start with our presentations and discussions, I would like to present a few general remarks on the state of, of the relevant historiography. Since the 1990s, the new global historiography has published various syntheses with the claim to shed new light on outdated interpretations of long-lasting historical periods and the past of global interconnections. In doing so, these works triggered a veritable boom, which in addition to new books on world history or transnational history, called forth many studies also on connected history, international history, and similar fields of study. From today's perspective, it seems almost like an irony, at least to me, of historical writing that the temporarily very effective talk of the end of the grand narrative has been corrected, either directly or indirectly, by the new global history. To this observation, we can add institutional factors. New chairs of history were established in this field, accompanied by the founding of new journals or the establishment of electronic portals, which considerably increased the presence of global history. In the meantime, various introductory works, um, I'm thinking also of the one by Ulan Benzelhümer and textbooks have appeared, which offer very good orientation to all interested readers. Nevertheless, it is hard to overlook the fact that these questions that the methods and also the concepts of this new area of research have meanwhile reached their limits. Looking back over the last two or even three decades, skeptical voices can be identified early on. Jürgen Ostamel, one of the most internationally distinguished global historians, recently complained that global history was even exposed to the danger of losing a sense of proportion by underestimating social structure and hierarchy. He stands by no means alone with this objection, as other academics also expressed their doubts as to whether this perspectives of, global history, of, of the new global history would not ultimately consign to oblivion all those who had not participated in the many transfers or did not want to participate, to participate in them at all. The historian of France, David Bell, critically remarked that the global turn for all its insights and instruction has hit a point of diminishing returns. Now, these very selective comments clearly indicate that the adventurous spirit of the initial phase slowly disappeared or is about to disappear, and it gave way to a more sober stock taking of the potential and the limits of global historical research. Our workshop will look into some of these problems perhaps problem zones in a more detailed manner. On the one hand, the papers aim to accentuate the polycentrism of global historical experiences. On the other hand, they will reconsider kind of meta categories, historical meta categories such as space with a view, for example, uh, on the Mediterranean, but also of time 
if we think of the world economic crisis and the Cold War and development policies. Furthermore, the papers will discuss selected key concepts of social history. That means, for example, the bourgeoisie in a global historical perspective. And they will also discuss aspects, problems, which I do not know yet so far. And that may be, that may be one of the best things we can expect that we are all looking for to hear something new. Now, as our time is limited, we should begin immediately with the presentation of the papers, of the first three papers, which will be followed by a short discussion, half an hour's discussion. At this point, I hand over to Gabriele Dottavio, who will be the chair for the coming two sessions. Gabriele, the floor is yours. And maybe we can switch to the third slide, uh, Isabella, because that uh, contains um, program of our discussion. Gabriele, if you like, you can continue. Okay, good, good afternoon everyone. And many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. Uh, it, I'm very glad to take part in a webinar with so many well-known names and familiar faces. Uh, yesterday I had the chance to give a first look at this uh, freshly printed special issue of the Anali Yabu, and I also got the impression uh, that as a whole, all contributions offer an interesting observatory from which to scan this uh, self-reflexive, if I understood correctly, uh, um, historiographical turn in global history facing, and Christoph Cornelissen was, was talking about. So I'm looking forward to hearing all the presentations, uh, both, both those uh, which are based on the articles which you can find in this special issue and the other presentations, um, which at least looking at the titles, it seems to me that they fit very well in the general, general framework of a polycentric global historiography. Uh, as it has already been said, we have two sessions with three speakers each. Uh, in the first session, I will leave the floor to Roland Wenzelhümer, Kieran Klaus Patel and Laura Di Fiore. In the second session, Marco Merigi, Sara Lorenzini, and Christoph Cornelissen will present their uh, contributions. Um, the first speaker uh, is uh, Roland Wenzelhuber. He is a uh, full professor of modern and contemporary history at Ludwig Maximilians Universität in München, where he is also director of the Munich Center for Global History. Uh, of course, all the six speakers have written extensively on global history, so I hope they will forgive me if I will uh, recall only a, a few of the words. In 2012, uh, Horan Wenzelhümer published a book uh, connecting the 19th century world, the telegraph and globalization. More recently, uh, he has published a book-length introduction to global history Global Geschichte schreiben, eine Einführung in sechs Episoden. And since 2019, we have also an English edition of this book, which was published by Bloomsbury. Today, he will present the paper Disconnections in Global History. Professor Benzelhümer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to participate in this workshop, um, which I have gladly um, agreed to do because it's a, it's a chance for me. It's an opportunity to to, to present um, something to you that is, on the one hand, very close to my heart or my academic heart at the moment, and which is, on the other hand, something that we are currently trying to develop in Munich in, in the context of a, of a bigger colleague that we are currently establishing. So it's both something that is explorative in one way and also something that is getting more contours or more structure um, just at the moment. And so it seems to be a good good moment, a good point in time to share this with you and see um, what we can do with it. So um, I want to talk about disconnections, this um, connections with, uh, um, um, well, you see, with, with a, um, I'm lacking the English word, with a semicolon in between the dis and the connections. And you will see in a, in a second what we mean with that, but maybe a short introduction before we come to that. So if you think of the still 
short history of the 21st century, we've already seen a, a number of quite major crises. Um, think of the financial crisis of 2008 and the following years. Think of the so-called climate crisis or think of the current uh, corona situation. Now, all these crises um, are different in a lot of aspects, as you very well know, but they all share at least one common background, and that's the background of globalization and of global integration, of course. The worldwide financial crisis of 2008 developed from a local US real estate bubble into a fully fledged worldwide disaster via countless financial cross obligations, etc., and so on. The climate crisis is deeply connected with questions of industrialization and global mobility, and the corona virus, of course, spreads easily via our worldwide trade and mobility networks. So it's quite obvious that these are not just crisis, but actually they are particularly unwelcome phenomena of globalization that could not unfold in the way they do without the global entanglements that we all have created in the last, say, 500 years or so. And this is also, I think, the reason why these crises have so far been interpreted mostly as crisis of globalization, or at least as a particular kind of aspect or form of globalization, both in academia and in the wider public. I claim that a rather simple understanding of processes of globalization is still employed and also forms the background of, of how we kind of engage with these phenomena of crisis. It's an understanding that is mostly linear um, and falls back to a linear process of integration of what has been called time-space distanciation. Um, the relationship between social interaction and spatial distance is continuously becoming less pronounced, or so is, it is claimed. And basically, our understanding of globalization is still a variation of more simplistic notions, such as the world is flat or the world is shrinking. More recently, historians and other humanities scholars have, of course, become increasingly uneasy with such an oversimplistic notion of globalization. Already several years ago, historian of Africa Fred Cooper remarked that such notions do not work for African hi history, and he, of course, implied that uh, such notions would not work for many other contexts as well, uh, and others have taken up Fred Cooper's argument and, and kind of developed it further. Recently, some historians have tried to mitigate, uh, if we may say so, mitigate this by pluralizing the concept of globalization and by speaking of different globalizations now, all of which have different paces and rationales. So that's the status at the moment, I, I think. Yeah? And all of this is helpful, I think, but it does not really tackle the core of the problem, I claim. It, does, it doesn't really amend our vision of globalization as basically a process of integration that and these are the new additions, sometimes go faster, sometimes slower, sometimes it holds, and sometimes it is even reversed. That's all true, but it doesn't really bring us closer to how processes of globalization really work, how they impact on historical actors, and how they unfold their historical significance. As you surely know, Princeton historian Jeremy Edelman provoked quite a debate in the field of global history with his 2017 article, What is Global History Now? In this piece, he raised a number of reminders and criticisms that I cannot recount here, but that were all taken up. Can you still hear me? Yeah, that this, there was a disconnection. <laughs> which yeah, is very good. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Sorry, that I was disconnected for a moment, which is probably an ironic play on the title of my <laughs> my, my uh, lecture. Um, sorry for the disruption. So <clears throat> we've been uh, talking about Jeremy Edelman. So he raised a few, a number of reminders and, and criticisms that I cannot recount here, but that were all taken up by other scholars and debated quite hotly, only one of his points was not really followed up any further. And that was when Edelman reminded us that we should not forget the role of disconnections in global history. And I think he is right. What Edelman meant in his piece were those people and places who could not really participate in globalization or didn't want to, yeah? who were marginalized in the process, detached from the development. And he basically reformulated a critique that critics of globalization have been sharing for many decades, 
but very aptly and rightly adapted it for historiography, so to speak. I agree with Jeremy Edelman, but I would even go further. I claim that disconnections are basically everywhere in current as well as in historical processes of globalization. I claim that they form a central part of such processes, especially as they interact closely with global connections. In many cases, there is a considerable field of tension that arises from such an interplay of connectedness and disconnectedness. And I think that it is this field of tension that is one of the keys to really understand and interpret processes of globalization and their historical significance. To put it a bit differently, I believe that every actor of globalization, every place or region that is entangled in processes of globalization is at the same time embedded in global connections and disconnections. These connections and disconnections intersect in people, in places, in institutions, and create a particularly interesting field of tension, sometimes of conflict, that co-shapes the life worlds of these actors um, and, and, and also produces a, kind of a field of tension that these actors then have to navigate and somehow make sense of. And it is this particular interplay um, between connections and disconnections that we in Munich try to capture with the artificial term global dis connections yeah so it's it's an artificial kind of kind of thing um there are countless examples for this in the greater realm of history um for this brief talk as this is really just explorative i have decided not to expand on one particular example as i've done on other occasions but rather to hint at the somewhat thicker tapestry if you want of disconnectivity I've decided to briefly revisit themes from three bigger research projects that I've done in the past and highlight their disconnective elements. All three research endeavors originally emphasized the importance of global connections, of course, in their practical, in their particular settings, and they still do so. However, looking back from today, I cannot but see how important interruptions, absences of connections or detours yeah, were in these contexts something that I have somehow known as well when I contacted these projects, but something that I back in the day could not put my finger on in a way. This will be very brief, just a few sentences per project. In the discussion, of course, I'm happy to provide more detail on any of the mentioned cases or context. And, as it, and it goes without saying that the following samples are not exhaustive. They really spring from my own historiographical work and simply serve to illustrate my more abstract points. In my dissertation, I've worked on the socio-economic history of, British, of the British ground colony Ceylon in the late 19th century, and coffee and later tea plantations played an important role in this context. And particularly the tea plantations in Ceylon depended on migrant labor from South India. The history of migration between India and Ceylon, even though they are so close, is a very complicated one. I knew that back in the day, but re-examining the particulars of how Indian laborers came to the Ceylonese highlands and back again, I today see a story of very few straight lines and straight connections. I see lots of detours, long periods of waiting and interruptions. Migrants were quarantined in camps around Colombo to prevent the spread of diseases, particularly of the cholera. Others were deliberately sent along a long march to the highlands along the so-called North Road, a march that was both a connection, a road, a, a, a kind of a journey to the highlands, and at the same time a disconnection um, because it was meant as a quarantine, as a, as a kind of a traveling quarantine. Yeah? Countless people died on this march with next to no health care and other forms of support. And on the highland plantations, of course, the Indian laborers led not only a strenuous, but also a very segregated life. Of course, these are all widespread phenomena in the history of migration as such. Still, we mostly envelop migration in a story of entanglement and exchange, while we downplay and overlook the disconnective elements. My second book project looked at the history of the global telegraph network in the 19th century, and that's a truly connective topic, one would assume. And that's the case, of course. The telegraph's connective qualities are hard to overlook and important to study. Nevertheless, the global telegraph network, at least in the 19th century, is not all about connections. Quite on the contrary, 
What about the many regions that were not linked up and, relatively speaking, drifted away from the global centers of the day? What about the many, many instances when telegraph cables were severed and communication was interrupted? The early history of the telegraph in particular is a history of interruptions and misunderstandings. Ship anchors and tropical worms damaged underwater cables. Overland wires were brought down by storms or sabotage. The important cable from Britain to India, opened in the 1870s, was out of operation almost half of the time in its early years. In other cases, messages were tampered with and false information was transmitted. Contemporaries were crucially aware of these potential disconnections and went out of their way to navigate them sometimes successfully, sometimes less so. In any case, however, we need to take, some, take such interruptions or the absence of connections into account when we evaluate the significance of the global telegraph network or in more general terms of global infrastructures. Finally, just a few brief words on ships, very brief, I promise. More recently, I have started to look at, at or to work on shipboard life and the significance of long-distance ships and ship passages in the 19th century. My general assumption being that the long, long time that many people spent on board of ships was a formative time in many respects and deserves to be studied in its own right. In any case, the ship is a highly disconnective environment. On the one hand, ships provide and build the global connections that we all examine in global history. On the other hand, while doing so, ships are highly secluded environments, at least until the start of the 20th century. Once they are out of harbor, there is very limited contact with the rest of the world. The shipboard community is left or largely left to its own devices. I claim that in all these examples, it is the interplay between being globally connected and disconnected at the same time that creates the specific character of a situation or a historical context that allows for the course of events to unfold in a particular way. And I claim that we need to dedicate much more attention to this interplay and its historical significance. Let me end by taking up my initial words about these different crises, if you remember. Yeah? The corona lockdown or lockdowns reminded us that the corona crisis unfolds not merely in the context of high global connectedness, it highlighted the disconnective elements and the field of tension that arose from being disconnected in an otherwise connected world. Now looking closer, however, it becomes clear that the other major crisis that I mentioned before unfold in a similar interplay of global connectivity and disconnectivity. The financial crisis started as a real estate bubble that spread worldwide because mutual trust and creditability broke down. It evolved in an interesting interplay of debt connectivity and trust disconnectivity that somehow had to be navigated. The climate crisis is another example. Climate change is one of the few really global phenomena that does not recognize political or cultural boundaries. In our action against climate change, however, we are constantly reinforcing such boundaries and only rarely manage to leave national, regional, or continental considerations aside. Our reaction to climate change is deeply disconnected while the phenomenon itself could not be more global. I think I'll end here. It was really just a, an explorative kind of attempt to highlight how I would suggest we should look at global connections and disconnections or start to look at them. I hope this is a little helpful and I'm not quite sure if I stood, stood within my allocated time, but I tried to at least. Many thanks for your patience and attention. So many thanks for all this very stimulating presentation, which introduced us to the topic of uh, disconnections and also to the one of, I would say, to of deglobalization. And this leads us straight to the second presentation and to the next speaker. Kiran Patel is already well known here in Trento. He is a full professor of European history at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in München, uh, where he is also director of the Project Europe House. Uh, Project Europe is also the title of one of his most uh, re recent books, uh, Projekt Europa, and uh, Kritische Geschichte, which was first published in German by Christian Beck Verlag. And in 2020, an English edition of the book 
Project Europe was published by Cambridge University Press. Thematically closer to his presentation of today is the book The New Deal, A Global History, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2016 and in 2018 also by the Italian publisher Einaudi. Um, today he will present the paper of the Global Economic Conference of 1933 and questions of the globalization. Uh, Kiran, the floor is yours. Gabriele, thank you very much for the kind introduction and also to everybody at the Instituto Storico for, for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to share this moment with you and I should already now apologize because I have to leave you at 3 p.m. sharp for another meeting. So in that sense, this connection is something that Roland didn't just elaborate on, but unfortunately something that will also stay with us as a theme in real life. Now, um, Gabriele was already kind enough to mention the topic that I was going to talk about about. And as Roland, I would like to try to aim at a more balanced view of this issue at stake than we have in the literature so far. And the starting point that many of you, or probably all of you, will be familiar with is that the interwar period, i.e. between World War I and World War II, is seen as a quintessential period of deglobalization. And my argument today is that this is quite problematic for various reasons, most importantly for the following three. Um, often this very much hinges on an unbalanced focus on the global north. Secondly, it reduces very much globalization to financial flows and not to other kinds of links between societies. And thirdly, it again, and this is very close to what Roland has just elaborated on, doesn't really look at the interrelationship and the dialectics between connecting and disconnecting processes. And again, I would like to elaborate on this by giving you one concrete example in the some 50 minutes that I have, that is this World Economic Conference of 1933, basically building a little bit on my own work, but also a new project by Stefan Link, um, a colleague at Dartmouth College in the United States. Now, some of you will probably know that this 1933 London Conference is often seen as the symbol of deglobalization during the interwar years, because it was basically meant as an attempt to overcome the Great Depression through international cooperation, and it utterly failed, particularly in the field of trade and monetary policy. And in the standard story that we have in the literature, but also for broad knowledge, there is also a main villain, which is, of course, great for a good narrative. That is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who with a message um, that he gave um, in, at the conference, the so-called bombshell mel mel shell mel message on 3 July 1933, very clearly came out against economic cooperation and argued that one should first find a national solution in the United States, but also around the world. Now, I argue that there is several problems with this narrative. Firstly, um, and this is going back to my three points that I made before, again, a focus on the global north in the existing literature, that it reduces the dramatis persona um, in a way that is problematic. Um, it very much only looks the story that we have, that is particularly in the work by Patricia Clavin, but also uh, beyond academic literature, for instance, in the account by H.G. Wells from the time, at the delegations from the big countries of the global north, of Western states and empires, and also bases that account only on their sources. And I argue here that there were important actors from the global south present, even if they have been ignored largely so far. And that methodologically certainly implies that we need to widen the campus and diversify sources, the source space that we have, also beyond a rather Eurocentric view on this global moment. And again, the rather self-important, if you will, um, narratives of white men who then also were powerful in writing about these issues. Overlooked so far is particularly the representation, as I mentioned briefly already, from the Global South. Uh, let's remember that there were 64 countries represented in London at the time. Um, also, for instance, from people from Bolivia, Peru, Mexico, Liberia, Ethiopia, Iraq, Turkey and Siam. And also rather renowned people from the time, such as TV Song from China or Paul Rebisch from Argentine, people who I'll come back to um, slightly later in the presentation. 
Also, if you just look at the kind of main narratives that we have, there were other topics being discussed beyond the gold standard, a technical issue that has to do with monetary integration at the time and debt, other issues that really mattered a lot and that we should also take into the equation, such as debt cancellation and the acceptance also of national measures of indebted countries to protect themselves. Something that, for instance, Pedro Cosillo from Uruguay argued for as Stefan Link has recently shown. Hence, um, what you have at the moment in 1933 is already a debate that focuses on the injustices of a world economy shaped by empires and not just issues that revolve around the situation of the North Atlantic world, but something much broader and more interesting. So if I want to summarize this first point, and I would like to argue that we need to look at other actors other sources and, and other themes to gain a fuller understanding of what was going on at the time. That brings me to the second point. Remember that was that we should also look at other forms and links between societies, not just at financial ones, if we want to talk about disconnections and connections in the context of globalization. Again, so far, what dominates in the literature is this monodimensional view that really looks at this conference as a failure, corresponding with wider effects for the 1930s. Remember that dark valley narrative that people like Pierce Brendan, for instance, have shaped in the literature about their period. And again, that sees London as a key moment in their process. Now, again, my claim is that a focus on diplomatic and economic history does not suffice. Yes, some important goals were not achieved in London at the time, but also there were many important other links which also are summarized and epitomized by the London 1933 moment. Again, this has methodological implications because it would force us to go beyond diplomatic history and also a certain brand of economic history, while also bringing in other economic legs as well as new approaches to the history of global knowledge, of infrastructures and politics and so on. And let me, for that, just give you three examples. I think, firstly, there is a story to be told about global consciousness going on at the time, because what you had is actors who gather it in 1933, again from the republics of Latin America, from China, Ethiopia, and elsewhere, who were very much aware of the global nature of the problems. There is very clear evidence that there was an awareness to live in a globalized world, at least among the elite actors that we're talking about. I'll come back to the elite dimension of this slightly later. Secondly, to be very brief, I think there is the dimension of global infrastructures because you needed something to make that conference possible and that in itself is already a fact of global interconnection. The League of Nations obviously provided a background for this. International conferences had um, experienced an upsurge since um, the First World War. Trips, translations and all these kind of technical dimensions that we tend to summarize at the nuts and bolts, the infrastructure underbelly of such conferences should also be taken into consideration that um, also remind us that technically the organization of this conference was very smooth, even if again some of the political implications were different than anticipated by those who hoped for real results. Thirdly, I think that this is also an example for global communication of the kind of 1933 and reminds again of global infrastructures at the very moment the conference took place. I mentioned this message by Franklin Roosevelt as US president at the time. Now the point is, and this is nicely linking this back to what Roland has said a second ago, on his yacht at Amberjack 2, kind of cruising the North Atlantic, um, somewhere off the um, US American coast. And from that um, yacht, it was then telegraphed from the heavy cruiser US man Indianapolis, as a US battleship, to London. So a technical form of innovation that really shows us something about the links that were possible at the time and more specific for the 1930s that was accompanied by travel diplomacy. Um, Raymond Moley was one of Roosevelt's closest advisors and he really took the plane in order to also be present last moment in that conference in London, whilst the international press was also in following his traumatic flight across the Atlantic live, basically, 
also investing a lot of hopes in what message he would bring. So in that sense, travel diplomacy and interconnections of that kind is also a story that really harks back to that London 1933 moment. So in that sense, also in the second point, I would like to um, remind us of new dimensions and approaches that are very important. Now again, thirdly, and this is probably also the closest link to what Roland has just said on connections and disconnections, I would want to underline the dialectics between connections and disconnections. Yes, of course, if you look at the perspective of, um, of European and US American actors, there was disconnection because these goals with regard to trade and monetary policies were not really reached. But I think there is a rather dichotomic um, understanding of connection and disconnection that is too simplistic, again, exactly as Roland has emphasized in his more conceptual piece. My claim is, again, very much in sync with his, that connections and disconnections often came in tandem and also had shared trajectories with effects also beyond 45. And in that sense, while we look at the dialectics, we also often need to factor in a longer period of time than the temporalities that are often used in talking about the history of globalization and deglobalization. So again, and you see this the structure that I also always want to briefly reflect about these points at the methodological level, we need to combine these various dimensions, connections and disconnections, by also including comparative perspectives and um, see then how they interact with each other by arriving at a more pluralistic understanding of processes of, of D and globalization, also beyond these rather simplistic categories of triumphalism and declensianism, i.e. where either you have more or less and more globalization is good and less is bad. Um, this brings me to the concrete example here. Again, I mentioned that on the level of debts, certainly the conference can be considered a failure. Um, also, especially also for societies in the Global South that were asking for changes there. But I think what has been not seen enough so far, that this also leads in that 33 moment in London to new discussions, and actually I would like to argue for a new consensus between actors in the Global North and the Global South, that one should really concentrate on national development economies, i.e. that global cooperation was not really in the cards, but national development. And this is something that Sung, again, this Chinese finance minister, who later became an important expert in Taiwan, very much elaborated on. And there is also, as a second example, the idea to go to more managed currencies beyond that gold standard idea. Again, the technicalities are quite complex and I'm happy to come back to them in the Q&A. Um, but whereby you had a new consensus on how to do your economic policies in a very crucial field, i.e. Uh, currency policies. And thirdly, as an example, what you see at the period is the rise of central banks that really didn't exist in all countries, neither in the global north nor the south. And where, for instance, also as a reflection of that 93 moment in London, you had that introduced in Argentine under Prebisch, whom I've mentioned before, since 1935. Thus, if you will, there is a shared story on how a formerly dominant approach of internationalist but also imperial cooperation was now replaced by a more nation-centered state policy focus on national development. And this again, not only in the global north, but also the global south. So if I want to put this um, in a nutshell, I'd argue that disconnection was not a policy only by the United States. It was a shared project across countries and actors in the global north and the south. There is a parallels and a lot of mutual observation and discussion between these approaches. And again, there is an impact, particularly long durée, if you look into the global south, again, where particularly this national development policy approach then starts to loom large also after the Second World War. So in that sense, to summarize this third point, new perspectives and different time horizons need to be brought in. To conclude, and I'll be very brief there, I still think there is problems also with the approach that I have. There is still, of course, a weak teleology imbued in terms such as globalization. 
And if you will, I've now also offered you another alternative account of globalization that tries to bring in more complexities, but also certainly brings in other forms of connections, while obviously also uh, talking about this connection moments. The second point is that I do find it particularly challenging, and this is where Roland and I have been discussing this before, but I think where we all need to uh, spend more thought on, on how and where to identify also um, positions of disconnection. So what I was particularly interested in is, for instance, the effects of these currency management for China. And the point is that we can very much see this global consciousness dimensions in elite um, discourse amongst Chinese actors at the time. I was talking to quite a few people who are experts of Chinese history, which I obviously I'm not, who were, I was asking whether one can see reflections of that also in sources in the provinces and in the everyday life of people. And that research hasn't been done yet. So in that sense, the question in how far that global consciousness travels and how it impacts people's lives is something that I would consider still a lacuna, whether there is more an idea of isolation of local effects and dynamics while looking back and seeing this also through the lens of economic history, we would arrive at very different examples. And this is the second point on global consciousness and basically how, how do we do this? And the third one obviously is a very pragmatic one that of course um, we often then very much in this kind of research um, have to work with elite actors and the further we go beyond that the more um, also having other sources and languages becomes an issue. Uh, so in that sense I would very much encourage you, us all to go that way but also want to certainly highlight the difficulties in doing so. Thank you again very much for listening to me for these 15 minutes or so. Um, and again, I have, I'm very sorry that I have to be leaving you in 15 minutes from now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiran, for this very rich and clear presentation and also for the many historiographical, conceptual, methodological and empirical insights. Uh, I think now let's go back uh, in time to the beginning of the 19th century. Our next and last speaker uh, of this session, unless we, we want to change the, the agenda, ask uh, Christoph Cornelius and if... Well, uh, as, as Kieran will have to leave us in 50 minutes time, it's, uh, it's perhaps advisable to um, ask uh, the participants whether they would like to address a question to him right now, because okay. uh, that would make more sense instead of um, sending okay, it. So we can we can have a brief discussion. Very uh, brief discussion. Um, all the attendees and participants of the webinar are invited to uh, post questions. They can use the chat bar if, if they'd like, or the participants can raise their hands and intervene. Mm. Well, maybe I will uh, simply begin with a very short question. Can, can you hear me, Karen? I hope you can. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thanks for your wonderful talk and, and the many uh, strategic uh, conceptions you, you presented, uh, strategic in the sense of where we will have to look in order to, to um, advance something in, in the field of global history, to put it that way. You spoke of a that project uh, when, uh, in, in view of uh, the many felt uh, disruptions and disconnections um, you, you were thinking of. My simple question is, uh, the people who had a vote in this, uh, is, is it necessary perhaps to differentiate between the ones who actively um, furthered processes of this kind and the marginalized ones, on the other hand? This is, of course, a very simple dichotomy, uh, to be sure, but uh, maybe we need to sort of to, to draw hierarchies, just as well as for the processes of globalization. Roland Wenzel hinted at that. There are marginalized groups, and there are also marginalized groups in, in reaction to the processes you, you delineated. And I wonder whether this is kind of social or political hierarchy is, is, is maybe a necessary adjunct to what you expounded. 
May I answer directly? Is that all right? Yeah, I think that that's best. Uh, right, right. Now, and again, I'm really sorry that I, I have this other commitment in ten minutes from now. And um, Christoph, I think this is a great question. And obviously, for brevity of time, I wasn't really able to talk about power relations and imbalances. Um, my point is that maybe so far we've looked a little bit too much at them. And again, looked at then only the key big Western powers, and that has led to this imbalance that has been distorting the overall direction. Because I would want to argue that those whom we often deem as marginalized and as secondary rate actors, be it Prebish from Argentine, soon from, from China and others, actually had very strong agendas, which also, if you look at the 20th century, then more altogether, and also transcend the barrier of 1945, had a fantastically big impact also on global relations. So in that sense, certainly they couldn't call the shots to the extent that the President of the United States could in 1933, due to the role that the United States had acquired by then in financial issues. But certainly when it came also to ideational forms of thinking how financial and economic issues should look and how one should manage them, there is a very much long-term impact that these actors also had. So in that sense, what I would want to argue is that power needs to be put into the equation, but certainly also beyond a rather realistic form, notion of power, one that also looks only at the short term and where the ideational dimensions and the long-term consequences need to be factored in and where I would argue that also these processes went through the bottleneck of 1933 and again, through this moment where these discussions really came together, the alternatives were on the table, and then there was a decision taken, if you will, again, not intentionally, but also very much with the contribution by actors from the Global South, that again, disconnection of sorts should be the way forward, that national development should be the way forward. And that is the point that I was trying to make there. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, Sara Lorenzini, please. Sorry. Okay, there I am. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Kieran, uh, for your uh, great paper. And uh, I, I just talk now because uh, actually, while you were talking about this national dimension, uh, it's exactly where I will go to at some point in my, uh, as I did in my paper, also in my presentation today. Um, and then I wonder, uh, thinking of globalizations and concepts that become global, in fact, you know, having the nation as the core or the state as the core prospect is something, is a concept that goes global per se, nationalism and as a consequence, decolonization is uh, is a way to be global too, don't you think? Sara, again, I gave my paper under your control, if you will, and it, of course, was also inspired by your recent book, and I'm therefore also particularly sorry that I won't be able to attend the second part of this afternoon. But the short answer is obviously yes. So in that sense, I would very much agree that also concepts, again, have a global history, and I do not want to say that this is the diffusion process from, again, Europe to the world. It's much more complex than that. But again, also, these kind of connections need to be factored in. So I think we've long gone beyond a definition of globalization that only looks at financial flows. But I think subconsciously, it still impacts more of the research than we tend to think. And again, as I was trying to say, and again, also inspired by the kind of research that Roland is doing also in his center, um, the dialectics need to be brought to the fore. In this case, also more the connections first, because here they have been overlooked. And again, the role of the nation state would be a very important example there. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, so thank you very much again, Kiran, for your presentation and contribution to the workshop. And we can now turn to the third and last. Uh, Perhaps just a, a short thank you also from my side. And, uh, many thanks, Kiran, and hope to see you again <laughs> in, in a context where we have a bit more time.
Despite that's the nice thing okay. about being in Trento that you can't be in a search committee in five minutes. You that's have right. to be there. Okay, you no, have no, a no, fantastic no. excuse. You do have our understanding. Back have in Munich. I'll stay with you and listen to Laura. I'm looking forward to the first minutes at least of your paper. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye, Kiran. So our uh, next and last um, speaker of this first session is Laura Di Fiore. She is an uh, assistant professor of history of political institutions at the Università degli Studi di Napoli, Federico II. Uh, together with uh, Marco Merigi, Laura Di Fiori is the author of one of the first Italian book-length introductions to world history, Le Rotte della Storia, which was published by La Terza in 2011. More recently, she has published book, Gli Invisibili, Polizia Politica e Agenti Segreti nell'Ottocento Borbonico. And Laura is also one of the contributors of the aforementioned special issue of the Annali, and she will present the paper, A Global History of the 19th Century Political Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, in my speech, I will try to uh, rethink um, two elements in particular about uh, global history. And the first one concerns the spaces mentioned in the title of our workshop, while the second one uh, concerns the subject of uh, one of the subjects of globalization processes often left on the sidelines, uh, that is the state. Uh, I will discuss these two uh, elements uh, and then we'll give an example. Um, through the intelligence activity for the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies carried out by the diplomatic headquarters uh, of Constantinople uh, in the aftermath of the revolution of uh, 1848. Uh, as for the first point, the scenario of analysis is uh, therefore uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, now, the encounter between the Mediterranean and global history, of course, was early and happy, and probably no region in the context of global history has had to confront uh, such an imposing and authoritative president uh, happened for the Mediterranean paper uh, there. However, the new global approach had proposed a different conception of the Mediterranean region aimed at overcoming the idea of a natural and cultural unity uh, as its characteristic feature. Uh, and in this direction, the new thalassology proposed by Horden and Parcel underlines how the distinctive value uh, of the region should be identified uh, um, in the density and variety of human connections that cross it. So the conceptualization of Mediterranean comes to place itself fully in the theoretical framework of the global history. Uh, now, mm, my paper is focused on the Mediterranean in a specific chronological phase, the 19th century. Uh, the first phase of the new studies on Mediterranean uh, devoted very limited attention to the modern Mediterranean, intended starting from the 19th century. More generally, the combination of Mediterranean and modernity is problematic to the point that, in some cases, it seemed an oxymoron, uh, as noted by Ben uh, Yerushada, uh, for which one would begin when the other ends. Uh, if modernity constitutes a problematic point uh, with which global history uh, is called to confront in the light of the Eurocentric matrix uh, of the master narrative of the rise of the West, it is, however, evident that the association between modernity and the Europe does not concern the entire continent. This emerges particularly about the more strictly political interpretation of modernity, which is mainly associated with the establishment of the rule of the law, the elaboration of its principles, forms of politicization of society and political participation. Europe as a political and socio-economic model has been identified mainly with England, France, Germany, where in the modernity, the Mediterranean simply did not participate as protagonists downgraded to uh, the periphery of the continent and limited itself to accepting models of modernity developed elsewhere. Um, thus, similarly to what happened for extra-European and post-colonial contexts, uh, also for the Mediterranean, there has been uh, talk in some cases of alternative or specifically Mediterranean modernities. However, recent years uh, have seen a real turning point in this panorama, represented by important studies that have dedicated unprecedented attention to the 19th century political Mediterranean, 
reversing more usual perspectives, these studies, for example, volumes by Zhang, Isabella, Innes, Philip Tucker, a return to Im the image of Mediterranean, which uh, rather than crossed by the uh, descending movement of ideas from the centers in the northwest of liberal Europe to the peripheral southern coast, uh, is configured with a polycentric profile. Uh, disregarding consolidated meta-geographies, the Mediterranean peripheries become epicenters of the elaboration of doctrines and concepts relating to liberalism, nationalism, democracy, in many ways original and non-derivative in their interaction with the French and British political thought. The shift of uh, the historiographical point of view has opened so uh, new uh, the way to a uh, reconsideration of the history of 19th century political uh, modernity, which highlights the importance of a global history oriented from the South, capable of rebalancing the Anglo-centric trend still prominent in global history. Uh, now, in context of this political Mediterranean, so reconstructed as connected by exchange and circulation processes, um, mainly conveyed through the mobility of people, um, I propose to focus on a subject more rarely taken into consideration, uh, as I said, the state. Uh, the emphasis on the networks of global history has very often meant uh, precisely uh, breaking free from mental frameworks centered on state formations, uh, hierarchical structures, and institutional protagonists to focus on alternative units of analysis. And yet, it may be interesting to ask how states interacted in turn with these networks, uh, formal or informal. Overcoming the state nation frameworks does not necessarily equate to housing the state uh, from analysis, but may mean trying to frame it within a new, broader interpre interpretative horizon. Mobility, for example, can represent one of the keys uh, to tackle the relationships between state and networks, to look at how the state faced the movement of people and global connections. Um, from this point of view, a significant novelty in the 19th century Mediterranean mobility is represented by the figure of the political exile protagonist of subversive mobility, which although not new in absolute terms, of course, uh, on one hand became distinctive of the European and Mediterranean experience in the aftermath of the Congress of Vienna, and on the other hand uh, was the subject of a renewed control in the context of the use of devices and identification and surveillance techniques of Napoleonic origin. What was the state's response to the widespread subversive political mobility? First, the surveillance of exiles carried out through the stiffening of the administrative border to prevent their return to, the, uh, to their territory, so fully deploying and connoting in a political sense the instruments of mandatory passports. But not only. The control over emigrants for political reasons was also articulated uh, in forms of close surveillance and that following the exits on their journeys, infiltrating their meetings, listening to their conversations, reading their correspondence. How? Um, the surveillance of the state outside the state was mainly articulated in the ways, sometimes integrated, of sending secret agents abroad and the attribution of renewed policing functions to diplomatic and consular personnel both equipped with an unprecedented institutional framework in connection to the modern 19th century police forces. Now, these methods of surveillance provided for a dislocation of the state control function beyond the territorial boundaries of the latter, a global articulation of the state itself, which was breaking up and multiplying in the tracks of the subversive. This articulation represented an aspect of the more general modernization process that recent historiography has highlighted for the development of the European state um, of the restoration and post-1848. Uh, this rearticulation of state structures and procedures provides, um, therefore, the opportunity for a sort of global history of the state, certainly much less pretentious than the one that engages one of the most recent threats in global history concerning the possibility of expanding the geographical and chronological boundaries of the existence of the state or of the state formations in the world historical experience. In this case, it would be a question of reconstructing developments, procedures, mechanism of state functioning by following the connections between the various operational fragments of the state um, outside the state borders and their intersection with other administrative and informal networks. 
Uh, as I mentioned, I, I would like to give you uh, an example uh, from the observatory um, of the legation of the Kingdom of the Sicilies at Constantinople, um, extremely significant as it was one of the main destinations of the post-58 uh, uh, Italian exiles, 58, sorry, uh, we sailed in large numbers toward the Mediterranean. Uh, in charge for the legation of uh, Constantinople was uh, Eduardo Targioni, who would have held the position until 1859. Now, since the, the consuls abroad were the only uh, responsible for issuing passports or visas to enter the Bourbon Kingdom, they were entrusted with the function of political filter through a circular sent by the foreign ministry upon request of the police, which prescribed not to issue travel authorization documents to individuals considered guilty of political crimes. The control uh, mechanism centered on travel uh, documents was further tightening after uh, 1858, as the prerequisite for the issue of documents to the kingdom became a certificate of extraneousness to the revolutionary events to be requested from the Neapolitan police. So state control was articulated in a transnational dimension, shoring up the barrier of the kingdom abroad, constituted by the diplomatic and consular network with the instrument of police territorial control. Uh, but the function of controlling the emigrants uh, was accompanied um, by that on their permanence. So the police asked the consuls not only for a mapping of the exiles, but also for a real activity of gathering information on them. And so the real diplomatic uh, intelligence activity was uh, configured. Uh, and concerning this activity, what emerged uh, what emerged is firstly that Constantinople was a note of particular importance both in the administrative network of the Bourbon consulates in the Mediterranean and in another network of a, uh, an interstate nature that was structured through forms of collaboration with the representative of other Italian states, uh, as in the case of the Papal State. Uh, from the correspondence of Targioni with consuls in Tripoli or Malta to exchange information on the movement of exile, it emerged that the communication between verbal legations and consulates, if sometimes uh, mediated by the foreign minister, very often took place uh, uh, directly. So the start outside the state uh, moved autonomously in a transnational space. But it was not, um, as I said, the only uh, network um, because uh, Another one uh, was uh, uh, very important in the Mediterranean area uh, was a laboratory for cooperation between diplomatic and consular offices of different states to pursue the common goal of monitoring the Italian liberal and democratic immigrants. If the latter developed networks of solidarity and transnational collaboration in the maritime space, so did the institutions responsible for monitoring them. Thus, for example, a cross analysis of documentation of two conservative Italian states uh, carried out with Chiara Grazio Monticelli revealed exchanges of information between Bourbon and Papal diplomats in the Mediterranean context. The Pontifical Council in Athens, Galian, activated the correspondence not only with the, the Napolitan counterpart in the Union Island, but also with Targioni in Constantinople, uh, given the difficulty to find information on a scenario which, not being Christian, did not provide for Papal diplomatic representation. So the cooperation of surveillance uh, purposes um, uh, activated between the two Italian states testifies the existence of a counter-revolutionary network operating in the 19th century engaged in the modernization of its state structures and control strategies which continue to develop a political project of a conservative kind and yields a persistent vitality of alternative patriotism, not only liberal, in the Mediterranean context. This element also emerges about the forms of cooperations, uh, cooperation sorry, activated with diplomatic representatives of other conservative states present in Constantinople. Concerning the custom developed by political exiles of evading arrest by placing themselves under the protection of consuls of liberal powers, in March 1851, the Neapolitan foreign minister, Di Marsilio, had suggested Targioni to agree with the representatives of uh, Russia, Austria, France to act in concert uh, um, in the Ottoman cabinet. In short, if British and, um, if British and American embassies offered uh, um, revolutionaries asylum and travel documents in their extraterritorial spaces, a specular alliance of opposite sign on Ottoman soil would have, be, would have been important for a transnational legitimist federation. The project was uh, actually limited to sporadic actions, never really taken off, but efforts made by Targioni in line with the foreign ministry shed light 
on a project of modernization of state apparatus. Um, a second element that emerges from this case study concerns how the activity of these fragments of the state apparatus came to intersect with a further non-institutional network, namely that of the exiles in the Mediterranean space, with their movement, voices, the news they circulated. This happened with the consular intelligence activity, namely uh, the collection of information through spies and informants, despite the difficulties expressed on several occasions by Tarjoni, probably also to justify the limit of his uh, action, spies infiltrated among the emigrants and more generally Formers remain the main resource of this intelligence activity. Um, also, because uh, um, revolutionaries uh, increasingly seldom entrust their communication through the written word. Um, so, the council recruited these informants, but also received the several self nominations, and he also undertook, in some cases, to collect information by himself, such as when following the death of a subversive. He went personally to speak to doctor who threatened him to find out if he had died of poison and with the priest confessor to discover any plot confessed in point of death. These events allow, allow a sort of gray zone to emerge between state bodies and the liberal international that calls into question purely oppositional readings of the relationship between the two subjects. More generally, this uh, relationship uh, developed in a complex form, uh, combining exploitation and collaboration in a bidirectional sense. Finally, the consuls also had the task of counterbalancing the revolutionary narrative through uh, the diffusion of different flow of information. The awareness of the centrality of political communication in the ongoing conflict led Tarjoni to assure the minister of the fact that, uh, I quote, every time the opportunity was offered, I did not fail to deny the absurd rumors that are spreading by excess. In the media arena, uh, the stakes consisted in entering it with the own uh, one own narrative, not leaving the crucial field of public opinion to the enemy. In conclusion, the renewal and rearticulation of extraterritorial state functions and structures, as well as the construction of cooperation networks between conservative states and the development of multiple strategies of interaction with the world of political exiles emerged in the, Med in the Mediterranean dimension which testified the permanence of, and liveliness of state and political projects as a part of a political modernity, even alternative to the liberal one in the 19th century Mediterranean. So I think it would be um, possible to further enrich the prospect of investigation disclosed by the new global history of the 19th century political Mediterranean with the history of a state uh, which in, in that Mediterranean also became um, global. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for this focus on the Mediterranean um, history, which sheds uh, some light both on global and transnational polycentric research uh, perspectives. Now, before conclu concluding this, um, this first uh, session, we have time for a brief discussion. Uh, maybe we can collect uh, some questions for the two speakers, Robin Bentley-Hümer and uh, Laura Di Fiore. All participants and all attendees of the webinar are kindly invited to intervene. Uh, Carlos Spagnolo, please. You. Carlo, you, you can switch on the camera and the microphone if you want. Carlo? Sorry, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it's fine. Okay, okay. okay. I suppose I should be speaking in English now. So, uh, my, my question is about this proposal of uh, uh, looking at global history through this dual category of connection, disconnection. Uh, I am intrigued by this idea. The question is, of course, first of all, for Roland, uh, Roland Wenzel Hümer. Uh, but uh, from this short presentation, uh, uh, I, I think it was perhaps too, too, too summarized. 
but I guess at uh, this dual category risks at least to uh, provide uh, two positive uh, meaning to the uh, connection and a negative uh, uh, meaning to disconnection. Mm? So to uh, provide the so, so to say te teleology uh, of uh, uh, um, um, narrative which uh, sees uh, increasing connection as always positive and uh, uh, um, loses the conflicts which arise from uh, uh, closer connection. It is perhaps the, the sense itself, itself of connecting people um, and cultures and and uh, so to say uh, even economies or uh, social networks, which are uh, in itself very far, <laughs> uh, which creates problem. I would say uh, uh, it is not alone the problem of disconnection. Oh, I, I agree with you when you say uh, the, the two aspects are entangled connection and disconnection occur together and should be looked at together. I think it's very true. I, I agree with you in this uh, perspective. But on the other hand, uh, my question is if you don't risk losing a lot uh, in this, in this um, approach and if you should not uh, include uh, uh, inequalities which arise from this dialectic, uh, from this, di okay, so I stop here now, okay. okay thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Carlos Spagnolo. I think we can collect uh, also a second question by Christo Cornelison. Well, two very straightforward questions, one to Roland Benzelima and one to Laura De Fiore. Yeah, the first one to Roland Benzelima. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, of course, very much impressed by um, your approach, which basically tries to get rid of the uh, teleologies and, and, and it puts an emphasis on, on the dialectics of connections and disconnections. My simple question is how to measure these processes? What are the right yardsticks to identify points of reverse or advance or disappearance? Uh, in a very technical sense, what what gives us um, the security that we um, get, really catch the glimpse of what, what what is going on in these very sophisticated processes? Of course, you can measure cables, and you know when they're functional, do not function. But what about social and political and other processes? When how how, how do we how do do we get a bit nearer to uh, the problem of really uh, getting a look behind the scenes? And, and my, my question to Laura Di Fiore is simply, um, as you were talking about the, the emergence or the development of a political Mediterranean, uh, wouldn't it be necessary, uh, to come back to my earlier question to pose to, to Kiran, about elites and the people? Uh, it's the simple question uh, as to the so social and political hierarchies. So who's, who's, the, who's mastering all these developments? And are the people affected by these decisions with their with the ruling classes or are there are there not so is that maybe and this is not of course only uh, confined to the mediterranean but maybe the mediterranean has a specific character in negotiating power relationships and maybe, would that be uh, let's say a level or uh, uh, a perspective uh, which could be investigated a bit more or needed to be investigated a bit more in detail Okay, I leave the floor to the two speakers. Uh, perhaps if we have time, we can also collect a second round of questions. Uh, please, Roland Pencil Um Thank you very much for your questions. Um, that's, I think that it's really important to clarify a few things because this was really a very compressed kind of uh, conceptual talk where loads of things kind of didn't find, didn't find its their space basically. So I'm very thankful for this opportunity and, and I'll start with Carlos' question if I may. So I think that's a, it, it, that's a very valid point because what 
we are trying to do is precisely to kind of counteract teleologies or counteract it's not always teleology it's more often i think it's a kind of an inbuilt trajectory that we have in our understanding of globalization that you also alluded to it's this you know more tight uh, more entanglements and so on it doesn't necessarily mean that this is always a, meant to be a good thing so more entanglements are good less entanglements or fewer entanglements are bad that's not always the correlation but of course you know certain global historians or there's a certain trend in global history where this can be observed i think yeah so it's precisely what we don't want to do we want to kind of ha have a more um, a slightly more sophisticated take, I think, on, on what's happening. But what you are completely right is that the examples that I brought from my own research on telegraphy and also um, on Ceylon, these very short examples, I think there is a certain danger there. You know, when you work on the telegraph, of course, most of the actors that you look at, um, they are keen enthusiasts, of course, of telegraphic connectivity. With the actors that we have access to, these, these are the ones who laid the cables, who used the cables, who telegraphed and so on. And of course, they are positive about the connection and they are negative about the times when the connections do not work. So I see the danger and I, I completely see what you mean that we need to be very careful, you know, not to, not to, not to kind of fall into a normative trap here. But I don't think that it is kind of an inbuilt danger in this concept of these connections. I think it's a danger that's always there when you work on, on globalization because there's a bias um, in the actors that you have access to. You know, we, we do have more, usually at least, we have more access to the enthusiasts than to the ones who do not feature. And that, that's, I think, the normative bias. Um, to Christoph Cornelissen, um, how to measure it? Um, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to, we can't really measure it in quantitative terms. So it's not about broken cables or working cables. Um, the methods will not be different from what we have done so far. But I think what we should do is, I think we should read the, the sources, the documents, the leftovers basically differently. We should, we should look for precisely the, the tension that arises from being connected and, discon and disconnected. And what that, that's what I mean. I think it's, you know, a focus on the actors reveals how if you look close enough and if you have a certain kind of an, an eye for it it reveals that our stories of how they were all connected and intermingling and so on that's only part of the story all of these people were at the same time also you know entang entangled if you want yeah in their in their disconnections and and these things come into play they create a very specific mindset there's a very very nice example i couldn't i, I couldn't really uh, use it today because it's a bit too complicated and too long, but it's about telegraphers being stationed on faraway islands in the 19th century. So we had a world spanning global telegraph network and in order to work that you, you needed relay stations on far-flung islands in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean and so on. And these people were at the same time the best connected people of the world at that particular time, yeah, because they had access to, to a global telegraph network, and they were at the same time the most remote people that you could think of, yeah, completely isolated in a way. And there's an interesting tension in that, and you can see this in the in the documents that these people leave behind. And I think we have to develop a sensory for these for these tensions. That's I think what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Here's a question of Maurizio. Uh, uh, I have a question for Laura Di Fiore. The global approach problematizes the study of the state as a historical phenomenon. How much is global historiography changing the idea and the conceptualization of the modern state? Uh, it's a big question. Maybe if I, if I may add, I have also a question for you, Laura, before leaving you, before leaving you the floor. And, um, from a quick reading of your essay, I, 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 I had the impression that you, you put the emphasis on this uh, new reconfiguration of also of a political northern Europe, uh, this dichotomy between north and, Medi and, and Mediterranean south. So maybe if you 
can expand on this on this aspect, connecting the, the question to what to the question of Christoph Cornelissen about uh, the relationship between elites and people. How widespread were these discourses on the new political Mediterranean and on the new political north in from in your in your research? Thank you. Not indeed. I will try to be brief. But, uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the really interesting answers about the elite and people. Um, one of the um, the reasons uh, I think it would be worthy to uh, further investigate this field uh, is that what emerge are um, social actors. So, for example, uh, studying diplomatic history in this new uh, in this new way, you know, in this new perspective, uh, can uh, reveal uh, many um, figures of social actors. Of course, if we um, if we look at, for example, consuls and uh, diplomatic uh, representatives, uh, we see uh, people from the elite, and they are a network uh, of. Conservative kind of uh, perspective, uh, counter revolutionary, no uh, outlook, uh, and of course they um, they belong to the same level of the uh, I don't know uh, revolutionary intellectuals, for example, because they are part of this uh, kind of uh, of network. But uh, if you look, for example through this relationship between the um, the diplomatic network and the elite, the, the excellence uh, network, uh, we can grasp um, many, um, many information and many, um, many discoveries about, uh, uh, for example, uh, these actors, these social actors, their new lives uh, in these places uh, far away from home. Uh, they, the, the, the works they sometimes uh, made up from nothing to no to to live, and so um, I think it could be really uh, a um, a good point to to investigate further this social uh, this social um, so the social dimension and in particular uh, I think it is interesting in the Mediterranean uh, to try to um, uh, turn in this uh, uh, in this global perspective the, uh, the study of consulates and the diplomatic uh, history because it was the place of birth of it and uh, maybe it kept a um, peculiar uh, um, um, uh, I don't know, um, disponibility to uh, tight a network uh, in this sense. Uh, as for the, um, um, the reconceptualization of the modern state, uh, as I said, uh, it is really um, for, for a sort of new uh, field of global history, the, this one about state and uh, institutions, uh, and of course, uh, the question. Uh, what is a modern state, uh, uh, and when uh, did it uh, did it uh, no arise? And this is a, a crucial question. Of course, this is a big issue, uh, but nevertheless, um, there are, for example, uh, there are some studies uh, interesting about it, and um, I don't know. I think the um, the idea that the modern state is not uh, um, is not something um, possible to um, separate from a disenchantment, for example, no, or from uh, so um, it is not possible to date it to uh, a to ancient uh, chronology is one of the position uh, in the field, and so. My impression is that this kind of interpretation has not been totally uh, rethought. But, for example, the idea is that the state uh, is not uh, a, something uh, exclusive, exclusively European, for example, uh, or a Western, a Western idea. So, uh, chronologically and geographically, uh, the um, the scope has been uh, widened by the global history, but I think it is uh, um, 
something like an embryonic field of, uh, of research. Um, um, what about uh, Gabriele, about northern and uh, southern um, Europe? Yes, um, it, it is more about uh, doctrines um, and, uh, of course, uh, the, the development of uh, intellectual um, um, uh, thought. Uh, this is uh, something uh, uh, well developed, for example, in the history of uh, ideas. Uh, my... Um, I, I try to develop a different story uh, from a more uh, institutional and material point of view. This was the um, um, the idea. Try to uh, reconstruct um, a way in which uh, political modernization in the Mediterranean developed uh, through the, the state structures uh, in an independent way. So with the dialogue, of course, with other European and uh, uh, North European experiences, but not, uh, but in an independent way, in a dialogue which was not uh, a, a reflex. Welcome back to our webinar on polycentric global historiography. Before leaving the floor to Marco Meriggi, I will briefly introduce him. He's full professor of history of political institutions at the Università di Studi di Napoli, Federico Sondo. And his most recent book is La Nazione Populista, Il Mezzogiorno e i Borboni dal 1848, Unità, which was published this year by Il Molino. And uh, Marco Meriggi is also the co editor, together with Christoph Cornelison, of the aforementioned special issue. And he will present his article, Social Mobility, Identities and Mediation, Reflections on the Global Bourgeoisie. Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Um, I'm speaking basically about uh, two books, uh, which uh, I try to show you now. The first one, Global Bourgeoisie edited by Christoph de Jung, David Mozzadella, Jürgen Osterhammel. It came uh, out uh, a couple of years ago. The other one, uh, this one, The Making of the Middle Class Toward the Transnational History, published by Ricardo Lopez and uh, Barbara Weinstein about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this is the ground uh, for some reflections, uh, which are reflections uh, basically on a concept, uh, bourgeoisie. And what I will try to do, the kind of game uh, which uh, I'm going to play, is the one uh, of connecting a concept uh, to these two categories, connection, disconnection, which we have been uh, speaking about uh, also during the first part uh, of our meeting. Uh, very roughly, this is necessary, the time uh, is not so much. Uh, and uh, roughly means uh, also something which is not complete, uh, naturally, with uh, renounces from the beginning uh, to every nuance. Uh, I think there is a, a great uh, connection between uh, the concept of bourgeoisie in the historiography, but even uh, in the culture, the concept of Western bourgeoisie and globality in general. Uh, starting from Marx, but uh, naturally we could start uh, even uh, before. Uh, going to the Fris, uh, for instance, uh, uh, through Max Weber, just three names, just to recall a little bit uh, the kind of uh, resonances uh, of the problem of the bourgeoisie. We could say that there is a, a very, a very deep uh, link between bourgeoisie, globality, modernity, and Western bourgeoisie is a label of globality in a way. Uh, the idea of globality that uh, we have until uh, recent time, I would say, is mostly an idea uh, about uh, Western dissemination uh, uh, all over the world, uh, 
it is a story of dominance, uh, uh, of material dominance, naturally. It is a story of uh, self-stylization. Uh, the idea that uh, bourgeois world is something different uh, from uh, the previous world uh, and that this new world is a good world, basically. And uh, further, I think that uh, bourgeoisie is even a concept uh, which uh, has known uh, a big deal of differentiation during uh, the last time. Uh, now, I mean, uh, the press, so to say, no, <laughs> is not so in favor of the bourgeoisie, which has nevertheless been uh, uh, in the past uh, a basic concept uh, of the self-interpretation uh, of the West. In terms uh, both of differentiation, of disconnection, I play a little bit uh, with the words, uh, of this connection uh, from uh, an inner past, uh, an European past, uh, and at the same time uh, also of this connection uh, in relationship vis-à-vis uh, -vis to the outer world. Uh, bourgeois society has uh, a typical Western label, identification with modernity, progress, uh, uh, freedom. Uh, this is the self uh, Stylization, naturally, is not uh, the whole truth, uh, even if uh, there are part of true in this kind uh, of idea. But at the same time, uh, I have the impression that uh, we can uh, uh, fruitfully play uh, with uh, uh, a concept uh, such as bourgeoisie, even from, for reflecting about these connections in the globality. Uh, what uh, uh, Herr uh, Benz Hümmler said uh, at, at the beginning of uh, his contribution, uh, uh, every, every actor in the global space uh, is both uh, connected and disconnected, I think uh, can be used uh, even for reasoning about the idea of uh, bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie is a general concept uh, it has connection, it has disconnection, deep disconnection, I would say, particularly if you uh, choose uh, to uh, develop uh, a global perspective. Western bourgeoisie is something uh, at the beginning very connected at the ideals of the 19th century, but if you see it in a global, uh, in a global space, uh, not only in the West, uh, but also in the rest, uh, it becomes uh, something else, uh, and I think uh, uh, something very deeply uh, characterized by, by levels of disconnection vis-à-vis uh, -vis European model. Um, it is a disconnection uh, uh, of societies, for instance. Uh, what the Western dominance, the Western global dominance uh, between uh, 19 and 20th century uh, shows uh, uh, is how deeply disconnected uh, is the world which is at the same time connected. I mean, uh, it's a problem of big difference uh, of society. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in the general use, uh, there is the tendency to uh, try to, to, to make the better of the uh, a general concept uh, of bourgeoisie as a uh, unifying concept. But uh, the global perspective uh, says to us uh, something uh, which seems to me very, very different. I mean, uh, the Western uh, self-stylization, uh, uh, bourgeoisie as a universal in politic, uh, political emancipation, freedom, individualism, uh, e economic and scientific progress, uh, rationalism, uh, disenchantment of the world, meritocracy, and so on. If you try to adopt this kind of categories uh, to other bourgeoisie, I mean the one which are not uh, the Western, what uh, results uh, is something completely different. And uh, I think that uh, this difference uh, doesn't allow us uh, to use uh, this concept uh, as a unitary concept. Uh, Weber uh, 
Max Weber always said, uh, nur im Occident, uh, only in the West, uh, to characterize uh, the kind of bourgeoisie which he had uh, in mind. At the same time, uh, he was also thinking that this kind of bourgeoisie had uh, uh, universal values. I mean, uh, something that could be shared uh, from uh, everyone in every corner of the world uh, as a goal, if not uh, as a reality. Uh, in this sense, uh, I think that uh, this kind of use of uh, concept of class as bourgeoisie, as universal, is deeply different from the concept uh, and uh, the characterization which are connected, for instance, uh, to another social category such as aristocracy. Aristocracy and the ancien regime uh, are generally thought of as local. Bourgeoisie is thought of as global. There is no bourgeoisie, no modern bourgeoisie without globality, whereas uh, aristocracy was mostly something connected to local spaces. I think uh, this uh, pretension of universality is something new in, uh, in human history, but it's always something which must uh, be uh, thought of uh, with, with particular attention to the local situation. Because uh, this uh, bourgeois global connection uh, is at the same time uh, a global disconnection to a big uh, amount of realities. Uh, when we speak about the rest, uh, we are not speaking only about uh, something which is not West, uh, which is not uh, European, but we are speaking also about something which is inside Europe. Laura Di Fiore was speaking a uh, short time ago about that, uh, as, she, as she said that, that uh, there is a problem of conceptualizing the South uh, uh, in, in the global history, but it means also the south uh, of Europe. Uh, Western modernization, Western bourgeoisie, Northern European bourgeoisie uh, means also a disconnection toward the uh, other part of Europe, uh, mostly the southern part uh, and uh, the eastern part, uh, which uh, immediately seems to belong uh, to a past time when the time of the western uh, bourgeoisie actually begins uh, another another i mean uh, this is something which was uh, deeply analyzed in the past uh, by so many authors uh, it's not something new naturally but we have to think uh, i think uh, about uh, connection and disconnection uh, if we link uh, these words uh, to a word like bourgeoisie, even in relationship to Europe. It is a disconnecting concept uh, in the history of Europe, uh, from the past uh, and uh, even uh, from the special point of view. Uh, another disconnection which I see when I think about bourgeoisie uh, in the long perspective uh, of the uh, 19th and the 20th century taken together is a disconnection uh, between uh, a 19th century bourgeoisie, Western bourgeoisie, and the 20th century Western bourgeoisie. Uh, a disconnection between uh, uh, a bright uh, and the dark side of the bourgeoisie, so to say. I mean, uh, I think that uh, the supposed uh, liberal, uh, not so liberal outside, but liberal inside Europe, uh, the liberal bourgeoisie of the 19th century is not uh, comparable to the sometime fascist bourgeoisie, Western bourgeoisie, European bourgeoisie of the 20th century. And I think that uh, this uh, switch in the time, I mean, uh, the, this uh, kind of changement of the, of the concept that you can usually connect to a word as bourgeoisie should be taken uh, uh, in, in consideration uh, when we use, uh, uh, I mean, a set of connection between bourgeoisie, modernity, globality, and so on. 
the dissemination of the liberal values is something which belongs uh, uh, to the ideals of the 19th century. It goes further naturally also in the 20th century, but with so many limitations that uh, we cannot think uh, uh, to this kind uh, of, uh, of a problem uh, as a unitary problem. There are phases in the history of the bourgeoisie as universal uh, concept. Uh, but the other side, uh, uh, I think uh, if you uh, put in the experience uh, of the uh, non-European uh, society, uh, the colonial and then post-colonial society, mostly in the 20th century. Here, the disconnection that you have vis-à-vis uh, -vis the original concept, uh, the original unitary concept of bourgeoisie, uh, typical of the 19th century, is even greater, in a way. Uh, there are so many cases very well documented uh, in these two volumes, which I, sh which I show you at the beginning of the uh, my speech, uh, who uh, give uh, a very clear illustration uh, uh, about uh, uh, a lot of situations uh, in which there is uh, such a tension uh, towards uh, being bourgeois and at the same time the frustration uh, of not being able to do that. I mean, uh, uh, the connection uh, through bourgeoisie is an ideal connection. It is uh, in part, uh, as Chakrabarti said, uh, uh, an imaginary connection to a uh, hyperreal West, uh, which means also a uh, hyperreal uh, uh, bourgeoisie, and at the same time, uh, a distanciation towards uh, this kind uh, of ideal. Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, there are so many cases uh, very well uh, documented uh, in these books uh, show examples uh, of uh, a desire to be bourgeois but uh, the frustration at the same time of not being able uh, to reach uh, such a situation. And there is uh, always another disconnection, I mean in conceptual terms, uh, uh, suppose that uh, bourgeoisie uh, should be an universal concept, uh, a connected concept, it becomes uh, clear that in the same moment in which uh, these ideas uh, uh, are not, uh, uh, th there is no, no possibility to, to reach the, this kind of ideal, the effect uh, is the one of a disconnection. I mean, we use this kind of word bourgeoisie for the 20th century, uh, the historiography uses uh, more frequently the concept of middle classes, and uh, there is a reason why, I think, uh, for this kind of, of change, also in uh, conceptualization. There is, a, I mean, uh, the effect uh, of a, such a deep uh, differentiation, such deep uh, a distancing from the model that you cannot anymore speak about bourgeoisie as the unifying concept which is i think uh, uh, a kind of uh, indication which goes in the direction uh, of thinking about the disconnections inside uh, such a conceptual framework uh, uh, as bourgeoisie this connection means uh, at the same time uh, adoption in a way, but also selection. It means uh, choosing uh, uh, by the local bourgeoisie a part of the Western experience, but at the same time also adding something different, something different, uh, which is different from place to place. I mean, uh, uh, the path of the differentiation uh, doesn't arrived to a, a same uh, stage, a same goal, it develops uh, a larger amount of different uh, stories of being bourgeois uh, all over the world, particularly in the 20th century. But at the same time, uh, I tried uh, until now uh, 
to 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 underline uh, to emphasize uh, the disconnecting problems uh, uh, which uh, uh, are in the core of, of, of the problem of what is bourgeoisie i would try uh, as last remark uh, of my speech uh, to spend the word uh, in fable of uh, the idea that uh, we can see bourgeois function as a connection and uh, it is uh, i mean uh, i'm not uh, it is not something new or something original it's very well uh, written and uh, argumented uh, by richard drayton for instance in the book uh, published by uh, the young uh, Motadel and Osterhammel. Mediation as function, uh, as basic function of the modern world. Mediation means uh, connecting uh, different uh, countries to uh, a dominant center. It means also connecting uh, societies which are different inside. Uh, uh, connecting different uh, social strata inside the society. And this seems to me particularly uh, the mission, so to say, of the non-Western bourgeoisie in 20th century, a little bit uh, all over the world, uh, uh, in the globality. A bourgeoisie which we have not to identify uh, mostly with uh, entrepreneurial uh, functions, but uh, more, much more a bourgeoisie which we have to imagine uh, as uh, a connecting uh, social strata uh, between uh, an above and the below. An above, uh, which is uh, in the case of most of the colonial and post colonial societies, uh, always uh, an above of traditional elite, uh, and the below, which is uh, the below of the uh, illiterate uh, masses. Uh, I think uh, there is, a, so to say, a, a basic differentiation that we have to think of between our idea of bourgeoisie as a connecting force in the 19th century and the idea of bourgeoisie as a, uh, also a connecting force but with other means uh, in the 20th century uh, I I want uh, um, to finish uh, uh, my my presentation my, my reflection my brief reflections uh, uh, quoting uh, this is uh, Richard Drayton uh, in the book uh, published by uh, Osteram and Motadella and uh, the Jung the history of the global middle class uh, is in the essence the history of global processes of mediation. Mediation means connection. But at the same time, uh, it seems to me that this kind of mediation is uh, uh, acted uh, very, very, very concretely by social strata which, has, which are at the same time disconnected from a dominant uh, global elite which is the western bourgeoisie these are only some ideas uh, in the essay which i wrote uh, for this uh, special issue of anali i tried uh, to uh, argument uh, to, to, to to extend my my considerations further I think uh, these are some basic uh, ideas which I've developed uh, working at this theme. And uh, I'm uh, uh, very grateful to you for having listened to me <laughs> in this uh, very short uh, and maybe uh, very pretentious uh, presentation of some basic uh, concept. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marco and Luigi, very much for this uh, for your critical reflection on the category of bourgeoisie beyond uh, a Eurocentric, Western-centric, or maybe Weberian conception of Nua investing. Now, let's turn to the next presentation, and let's move again to the 20th century. Our next speaker is uh, Sara Lorenzini. She is full professor here in Trento at the School of International Studies. She has published extensively on global history, 
her last book, Global Development, a Cold War History, was published in 2019 by Princeton University Press. Uh, an Italian edition is also available by Molino. And given her wide experience on this topic, she will present the article, Global Development in the Cold War. Sara, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Okay, good, cool. Um, thank you so much for uh, uh, your introduction, Gabriele. Thank you, Christoph, for organizing such an intriguing seminar on global history and for having me here today. Um, well, when I started thinking about what I should uh, talk about in this uh, short presentation, 15 minutes, I'll be on time. Um, uh, I thought, oh, we're, what we're discussing today is really the existence of different views of the global or of globalization. Uh, but actually what turns out from the discussion today is more specifically and what co will come out from my uh, contribution today is specifically how global phenomena are actually made up of many elements and uh, after all uh, differences and disconnections very often prevail. Uh, over this uh, idea of, uh, you know, the big global concepts that covers all. Um, so what uh, I will deal with today, as uh, perfectly introduced by, um, by Gabriele, is how can we look at development as a global phenomenon? What does the history of development, which I define here and in general when I deal with development as a process to turn poor backward countries into wealthy modern ones, uh, what does the history of development tell us about globalization? Um, let me start by saying that when I started working on my global development book back in 2009, I felt the need of uh, this, uh, of, of telling the comprehensive history of development that was missing back then. And coming from a study of inter-German competition in Africa, I was not at all happy with uh, was what I could find around with uh, these universalist interpretations that were very, very common, if not exclusive back then, where, you know, the American hegemony was pervasive. And I really wanted to add a European perspective to a then prevailing Cold War narrative of modernization as ideology that was exclusively America-centered. And instead, development was to me and still is a patchwork of different nation building projects that are often at odds with imperial uh, ambitions. Well, the picture in historiography has now, uh, thank God, <laughs> dramatically changed from what I was reacting to more than 10 years ago. Uh, and differentiation is now the new rule. It is so in the history of the Cold War. Think of Lawrence Luthe's recent history of the Cold War with its uh, regional articulation, for instance, and also in the history of development where the overwhelming concentration on the United States and modernization as ideology is not exclusive uh, anymore, not at all. Um, but having said this, let me go a little more into the topic um, of today and um, of my contribution to the to the to the special issue uh, that came out uh, two days ago, if I'm not wrong. Um, so. Um, in my study of development as a co global phenomenon, I have uh, touched upon many aspects of this enterprise. The fascination with planning, the enthusiasm for ideas of modernity, the way of economic constraints, um, the going concern with environmental consequences too. And I have explored particularly the hegemonic projects, and I stress the plural here, projects. And there are a deficiency in the uh, in the weight of ideology and economic, and mainly uh, of ideology and economic thought that was behind them. Um, I also uh, studied international organizations. International organizations were also actors I felt were misread in this uh, telling the, uh, the history of development uh, uh, back then. International organizations with their tendency to apply a one-fits-all approach. 
uh, international organizations that presented themselves as the ideal stage for a global development project. Uh, but during the Cold War, competing visions of uh, development were sharing the field in international organizations too. Uh, and uh, the recent book by Sandrine Cott, Organiser le Monde, offers this great fresco, fresco in fact, of the tensions between different ways to think of internationalism and globalization uh, during, uh, uh, during the Cold War. Obviously, there were major cleavages, uh, and this was quite clear everywhere. There were cleavages between the capitalist West and the communist East. We're in the Cold War era, between the global North and the global South, between donors and recipients, between national governments and international financial institutions. And uh, the competition took place everywhere, and not only along the Cold War uh, divide. Um, having said this, let me touch upon what uh, are the main points that I tackle in my article, and then uh, and how they speak to our conference today, as I as I see it. Um, and these three points are: uh, first of all, the nature of development as a Cold War project. Second of all, uh, the importance of the state and of national interests and national priorities that have so often made development controversial. Um, and third, the ambition I was mentioning uh, now, the international organizations, the ambition nurtured by international organizations to establish a universal framework for development. And in all three of these uh, elements uh, that I will, uh, these chapters, in fact, that are sections, I say, that I will go to uh, through now, um, you will see that actually, you know, there is, you know, this uh, global rhetoric that goes together with the reality of differentiation and division. Um, let me start with the nature of development as a Cold War project, um, because a number of historians who focus on development as world making uh, interrogate the validity of the Cold War as a framework to understand the history of development. And this because they argue that development as a global project existed before the Cold War and after the Cold War. So is the Cold War really? Uh, something that makes a sense as a periodization. There. And well, my point, the point I make in the book and the point that I make here uh, today too, is that although it's undeniable that development understood and presented as a civilizing mission back then existed before the Cold War, um, a Cold War lens is still useful and I believe necessary to understand the history of development because <clears throat> Um, well, I think that the Cold War keeps its value as a fundamental moment because it shaped incredibly many features of the development business as we know it today and of the development dynamics that we still see at work in the international arena uh, nowadays. For example, and uh, and. Uh, and, and importantly, when looking at the competition between American and Chinese interests in Africa that run through development projects, well, there you see that clearly Cold War dynamics acquire new importance and the Cold War as a concept emerges as an excellent explanatory and predictive tool to analyze what is happening in international relations today, even though uh, the big, the, even, even though we, as historians especially, we wouldn't talk specifically about a Cold War, but nonetheless a Cold War like setting is indeed uh, quite helpful in order to explain and also predict uh, um, what uh, um, the, the, you know the, the interconnection between and uh, the um, the action uh, in this uh, in this respect the interconnection between superpowers nowadays 
Um, so the Cold War, um, it was in the 1950s, in the mid-1950s, and especially in 1956, when the Soviet Union and its allies entered the development business, uh, that aid became a fully-fledged weapon in the Cold War uh, arsenal. Um, and until then, by conceding the several ways existed to solve the same problem and that experts have different and had differentiated approaches, development was understood as a linear process and modernity was conceived more or less in the singular. Uh, with the entry of the Soviet Union as a potential donor, instead development turned clearly competitive and increasingly it was uh, charged with ideological weight. Models were pitted against one another in this uh, very harsh competition of, about effectiveness and uh, about symbolic strength too. Um, Cold War uh, politics determined uh, the stakes, the timing, and also the distribution of aid. And this uh, symbiosis, in fact, uh, between development and the Cold War logics became absolutely systemic in the mid-1950s. Development became East and West an expansionist project, a competition to win worldwide support, and it was orchestrated as a black project. Um, I, it, this doesn't mean, and I don't mean that the orchestration, so this uh, um, making development a, a, a global to, a tool to find the global Cold War uh, was effortless because European countries had their own national in interests and disparate visions on aid and on development. And this was true both in the West and, uh, uh, and in Eastern Europe. European countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain instrumentally used the recipes proposed by uh, the superpowers or also by the experts in international organization and adapted them to their own political needs and to their own um, um, policies, in fact, a broader understanding of, uh, of strategy, of national strategy and national interest. Um, sometimes they explicitly contended that their methods were the most effective uh, to fight uh, the Cold War. Uh, Western European countries, uh, though, especially, were very jealous of their habits and very uh, skeptical about unhinging from traditional colonial knowledge and methods. They were equally jealous of their networks, of their traditional colonial imperial networks, in fact. Um, and the European Economic Community, I'm sorry that Kieran is, uh, is not here with us anymore. He would give his view on this, I believe. Uh, the EEC is probably the best example of how Europeans struggled with the idea of fitting into this American hegemonic project and promoted instead their own idea of regional hegemony, the idea of, uh, of Euro-Africa, an idea that somehow culminated in the mid-1970s. I believe Christoph is pro probably going to tackle that in one way or the other, with, uh, with the Lomé Convention brandished by the able rhetoric of Claude Chasson as a new option, a third way for the third world back then. And uh, <clears throat> again, the, the common policies of the uh, European economic community were complementing and not at all substituting national bilateral strategies that were still there, still surviving the global some national strategies. So the second point that I make in the paper and that I make here is the importance of the national dimension from the point of view of the recipients at this time. Uh, national pride and national building were, were back then in the Cold War and uh, in the 20th century, but are even now absolutely crucial to development. 
uh, the history of development is really abundant of leaders who used aid to promote a dramatic change in their country. In the age of decolonization, national leaders needed to show that independence would coincide with a new era characterized by progress and well being. And uh, they uh, needed to connect their name with great infrastructural projects. And this is what I touch upon in the, uh, in the article, also because in archival documents, it's plain to see that the donors, East and West, uh, faced a very specific request from the recipients of aid during the Cold War. They really did receive long shopping lists that typically included huge prestige projects that uh, were ranging from mega dams with uh, irrigation and industrialization projects to important railways, uh, roads, harbor construction, or also huge symbolic facilities like sport facilities, for example. Um, and donors were required to negotiate compromises on this point during the Cold War because they were aware that their clients uh, threatened to move to the other side of the Iron Curtain in case of rejection of their wish list. Um, big infrastructures became the ultimate symbol for, um, for political power, and this indeed was another global component. All of this was a global phenomenon. It was absolutely compatible across the spectrum of societal organization. Infrastructures could be the product equally, really, it could be the product of capitalist ventures or be associated with hardcore planning the socialist blocks way. There was hardly any difference. I mean, there was some working around <laughs> some uh, concepts and, uh, and discourse that went, uh, that went together with, uh, um, uh, with, the, with the project itself. But, uh, but really, infrastructures uh, uh, were compatible uh, um, with uh, um, with both sides uh, in the in the Cold War, indeed. Uh, also, many of these projects were in clear continuity with colonial projects, and uh, in um, in the paper and also in the book, I uh, uh, I describe I describe several of this uh, of these projects, and in the paper specifically, I believe. Uh, if it's not the, the only one, it's the one that received more attention than than any other, the mega dam in Kaurabasa, which is the ideal case, I believe, to study how post-colonial leaders, and this is the case of Samora Mahel, the charismatic head of Frelimo, the National Liberation Movement in Mozambique, reshaped a colonial project and converted the original shame to brand new purposes with the context of Cold War uh, dynamics. Brand new purposes that are uh, political, ideological, but also connected with a different idea, different view of society too. Um, so again, global strategies, global trends uh, that are articulated quite specifically in national projects connected with national ideas of national pride. And we have this, uh, you know, this, this story around infrastructure is what is going on even now in my next project, in my project now, I deal with dams and dam construction, um, also in very recent times. And the case of Ethiopia, for instance, is quite uh, dramatically alike many cases that happened during the Cold War with the huge potential uh, with the huge element of national pride, uh, national interest, the leadership and interest and potential conflict, uh, heavy conflict. Um, yes, so then the third point that I uh, make in the paper is uh, that development institutions uh, tried to forge a universal concept in the 1950s and 1960s, international experts uh, shared this uh, important faith in the state as an actor and in planning as a method, uh, making it really tempting to describe the history of development as a history of planning. So history of global development, a history of globalization of planning as a strategy. Um, because <clears throat> 
uh, well, and for quite a long time, honestly, planning as a method, even if it was orchestrated importantly in international organizations, put the state at the center. And in the ends of national elites in the age of development, as uh, Fred Cooper defines it, stretching from 1940 to 1973, economic growth became one with the national project and planning and state investments were absolutely key. They were the conditions that created the developmental state, in fact. This came to an end in the late 1960s and increasingly in the 1970s, at the time that works for disconnection, apparently, uh, um, in Christoph's uh, uh, paper later. I, uh, I'm really curious to listen to, uh, to your argument there, Christoph. Uh, when a um, crisis of vision surpassed uh, the 1970s, so the faith in the state as a fundamental uh, and the fundamental role of science and rational thinking in replacing uh, traditions. Uh, poor results in the distribution of wealth shook these uh, the optimistic view on economic growth, this uh, idea of growth that was bound to automatically translate into generalized well-being. Um, and this because poverty essentially persisted despite the incredible economic growth of the years of the boom. And this led to a, to a dramatic bifurcation, in fact. On the one hand, mainly in the global south, this translated into pressing requests of equity in development, and this meant unparalleled pressures for redistribution and social justice, requests for the appropriation of rights, and also a case for a drastic reform of the world order, the project of the new international economic order you're probably familiar with or have heard of. Um, on the other hand, in the global north, new anxieties appeared, particularly resource scarcity, unchecked population growth, a new concern with the environment and sustainability, and trust in progress as linear development toward modernity collapsed. So then at the end of the decade, while well, trust in state planning was soon to be uh, replaced by the generalized the neoliberal faith in the market, uh, the cost of global modernization exploded, leaving national elites in recipient countries with huge debts that they were unable uh, or unwilling or both <laughs> to pay. Um, at the end of the Cold War, with the collapse of real socialism as an alternative and the triumph, in fact, of the neoliberal order, the option for alternative global orders or alternative forms, forms of internationalism or alternative internationalisms uh, seem to uh, disappear, uh, at least until the very recent emergence of the new Chinese capitalist order, as described by Branko Milanovic. But uh, I believe that with this hint at uh, the future of uh, the Chinese empire, <laughs> global empire, I believe that I will stop here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I believe that the next chapter that I would open, and we can open together in the discussion and Q&A if we have time, would be, where do we go from here? Uh, but as for now, I thank you for your atten attention. Thanks a lot. And uh, I'll leave the floor to the next speaker and the chair first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara, for offering another critical take on the notion of development and on its role within the Cold War histories. Now, last but not least, our host, Christoph Cornelissen. He is a full professor of European history at the University of Frankfurt, and since 2017, he is also the director, director of the Italian-German Historical Institute here in Trento. His last book, Europa in the 20th Jahrhundert, was published by the famous editor Fischer in the series Neue Fischer Weltgeschichte, and he will present a paper which I guess it's will be based on this last very important book, um, Europa as a world, Europe as a world region, globalization, deglobalization since the 1970s. Herr Cornelissen, Sie haben das Wort. 
Thank you, Gabriel. Um, well, last but not least, uh, well, definitely last. In my brief intervention, I would like to make a plea uh, for a more polycentric and at the same time more parallel historiography of Europe's globalization and deglobalization, and I underline and deglobalization. And this uh, falls in with the line of arguments uh, presented in the Anali issue, uh, which has been mentioned several times today. Now, the topic, of course, is ultimately boundless. Uh, it needs to be briefly problematized at the outset. Uh, I will try to narrow it down a little bit, and I will deal with three arguments in more detail. I will define them in a second. Just let us first have a look at the extensive media coverage on this topic, globalization, deglobalization of Europe since the 1970s, because this can give us an insight into the complexity and very often also the contradictions of many of these public statements. And I think we are all part of these statements, and this is why I mentioned them right at the very beginning. In this way, it rapidly becomes evident that the prophecies about the future of Europe as a world region tend into extremely opposite directions since that time. On the one hand, many observers held that Europe would descend into complete insignificance and econ economically and politically. Um, the closer we get to the present, the stronger the voices of Cassandra became, and they are still with us. In the wake of the financial crisis, Time magazine spoke in August 2011 of a decline and fall of Europe. It brought the whole thing to the head in the thesis of a casino continent. This is where we are living. On the other hand, more optimistic observers identified excellent opportunities for Europe in the same phase to successfully embark on a third path towards late modernity in direct connection and competition with other world regions, namely with the USA and China. Now, I, I, I will not quote many of these voices uh, in, 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 in precise quotations, but the chorus of these mediatic interventions on Europe's role in the global economy has remained highly contradictory since the 1970s. I will make use of this undifferentiated chorus to shortly present three arguments. Firstly, in my view, we should try to critically discuss the core concepts of globalization, deglobalization, connectivity, uh, disconnectivity, and their mutual relationship, as difficult as this might prove. And basically, this is the question, where do they come from, these concepts, um, academically? Where, where, is, where, where do the takeovers take place? Secondly, I want to show that there is a surprising lack, something which still surprises me personally, of differentiated studies on the parallel stages. We have been speaking of dialectical processes of globalization and deglobalization. The, there's a certain lack of uh, studies, especially in a regional perspective. And thirdly, I will link this argument with the appeal finally to include systematically also other thematic fields to demonstrate the complexities when writing, when trying to write uh, um, parallel histories of globalization and deglobalization, something which still has to be done, in my view. Now, let me come to my first point, the critical, basically a very brief critical reading of the semantics. It is relatively easy as indicated to deconstruct journalistic contributions uh, to the challenges of globalization and deglobalization. My cursory study of magazines and dailies for the relevant keywords gives rise to the impression of cyclical ups and downs, indeed of a conceptual globalization bubble that now seems to be bursting. In other words, for decades, many academics and the media have sung the praises of an unstoppable global globalization and at the same time of a policy of privatization, liberalization, and so on and so forth, to which the world region of Europe would have to surrender in order to survive in Darwinian terms. Especially since the early 1990s, this debate has called forth the sheer explosion of globalization concepts that continue to sprawl, to be sure, the precursors of which appear in different linguistic variants right up to the present European expansion, world society, planetary age, world economy, etc. However, we all know that in the wake of the structural economic crisis, but above all the financial problems of 2008 and 2010, 
to, and we have to add also uh, in consideration of the current pandemic, the economic data have changed considerably. New buzzwords, new core concepts have emerged in their wake. And it seems to me that deglobalization, disconnectivity, and all the others, which are which can be positioned within the same semantic field, um, have sprung up like mushrooms. Um, and what, but where do they come from, these mushrooms? And my, my idea is that we have to have a very close look at economics as an academic, sub as an academic subject, and also a wide ranging um, series of management literature. And I've done that only very vaguely on the basis of, of um, the indicators which we have in the internet, so the Google metric, metrical data. And it is obvious that this is where they come from in the first case. And we should be aware of this fact in order not to fall prey to these tendencies uh, simply without being aware of what, what is happening. Now, in the wake of these cyclical ups and downs, it has become apparent that the academic discussion on this problem, and I'm referring especially to the debates in the political and social sciences, but also to our own historical discipline, that very often these debates have succumbed to the fascination of the concept of globalization and now tendentially also to, to well, the attraction of terms like interconnectivity, disconnectivity, deglobalization, without providing, in many cases, and I'm not uh, referring to our first speakers in this um, session because we uh, are trying exactly to deconstruct this problem, without providing sufficient epistemological and empirical justifications. And the interesting thing is that various semantic analyses of recent years have geared our attention exactly to this problem. Just let me mention here only a few publications, and they're all in German. I, this is, I will have to excuse this, excuse this, by Olaf Bach, for example, on the emergence and temporary, temporality of globalization debates. Uh, this has been published in a monograph, but also in several um, articles by Jan Eckel in the Historische Zeitschrift on the boom of globalization semantics since the 1980s. Uh, but also Wolfgang Kölbler's contribution to the Globalisierungsbegriff, this is the title of his article in the Vierteljahrshefte für Zeitgeschichte, uh, Globalisierung als Platzhalter und Rettungsanker der Sozialwissenschaften. The concept of globalization as a placeholder and lifeline for the social sciences. This is an article from 2019. Now, the title of this article, and we, we could add Ostermann, of course, also. Uh, we, uh, the title of Kerbel's article already contains the central thesis of his argument. The concept of globalization has been misused as a placeholder, and we should be aware of the problem that we tendentially, or some of us, uh, tend to now use disglobalization, deglobalization, disconnectivity again as a placeholder. When looking closer at the talk of these globalization and deglobalization dynamics, it often turns out to be very weak, in fact. Many global developments and their sub processes, as we know by now, did not lead to global conformity, to global connections. In practice, they rather led to different forms of regionalizations of regional or interregional networks. Maybe that th th these terms may be better placeholders instead of easily falling prey to the suggestions of globalizations and deglobalizations. Moreover, empirically and economically, globalization often meant nothing else than OECDization, so the, the, the becoming conform to uh, the rules of the OECD, as Kölbler aptly argues in his article. Now, in, I, in my recent book, I have built upon the line of this argument and upon these ideas. Thus, the narrative of my book attempts to show the increasing economic integration of many European regions, not certainly not all, in a phase in which the pressure, pressure of globalization was felt very strongly, both by entrepreneurs and the labor force. But I also take very seriously, at the same time, the idea of the tyranny of distance. And I think this is a wonderful formula from the, the writing of colonial history, the tyranny of distance. That means I've based my book on the empirically, empirically verifiable fact that economic interests, political claims to power, and cultural linkages constantly betray a dominance of intra-European networks over other world regions. So to put it 
in a nutshell, trying to deconstruct the idea that Europe was sort of being more and more globalized since the 1970s seems to me a misunderstanding if you look at the empirical data. Um, and I'm, I've, I've done that for several parts of Europe in more detail, not just in my book, but also for the presentation of this, this argument. Uh, and I think, uh, why, 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 why is, is this fact or this factor disregarded by many who talk too much, in my view, on globalization or deglobalization factors. This leads me to my second argument, which is a bit more precise and goes into detail more uh, in the history of the European economy. To be sure, there are already many important publications on the European economy since the 1970s. Uh, just to mention a few examples, even Baron Barry Eichingry in the Cambridge history edited by Stephen Broadbury and others, and many national and also regional studies. There's no lack as such. Um, these studies generally show that Europe has reached or began to reach a new stage of economic globalization since the 1970s, which affected foreign trade and also, which can also be seen in changed capital flows, production chains, and corporate structures. These are the basic narratives. While on the one hand, the economic rise of the Asian newly industrializing countries was taking place, many European economies were facing severe economic problems expressed in figures. This means that the world has been transformed by huge trade and investment flows over the last half century. Secure industrial jobs have evaporated in Europe and North America, and many of them reappeared on the other side of the world. Exports, which amounted to less than 10% of global GDP in the 1970s, now stand at 25%. And it is also easy to see that not all regions of the world participated equally in this change, especially the position of Western Europe, the more industrial part of Europe, was deteriorating fast. In 2003, its ratio had become less than one-fifth of the world production, and the situation did not improve until 2015. Now, that's the standard account of these general accounts of European globalization since the 1970s. But what do these figures and trends mean for a polycentric, more regionally based economic history of the world region? And how can we come to terms with the parallel experience of globalizing and deglobalizing de effects? First of all, it seems to me it would be wrong to explain these contrary developments by the increased weight of global competition only. A more sober explanation would draw our attention to the fact that after the Tron Glorious, the famous decades from 45 to, let's say, the 70s, the Fordist age simply drew to an end. Basically, the period since the 1970s in economic terms stands for a return to normality. And this is something else, instead of speaking of simply of a globalizing tendency. Secondly, one should examine the data for individual regions and sectors more closely because this can lead to a much more differentiated picture between regions and interregional zones. This approach then shows that the result of the crisis-ridden economic structural change since the 1970s proved to be by no means only negative. New industrial centers have emerged in various countries, especially in the western part of Europe, but also since the 1990s in Eastern Europe, with significantly higher growth rates than the old industries had been able to achieve. In these areas, new world market leaders developed as lighthouses of a regionally based successful transformation. Their advance can be explained not least by the fact that innovative entrepreneurs and the unions developed a modern company organization that regionally built on a long tradition of close partnership between industry and commerce on the one hand and the labor force on the other hand. Thus, both social and economic factors enabled a successful regional progress advance. Uh, the southwest of Germany is only one region in Europe where we would have to look more precisely to understand what is meant by this process of a social and economic process in the context of globalization, but very much in contrast to what general accounts let us know about the European fate, to put it in pathetical words. I will leave it at that. And I've tried to, I was about to show you the data for Hesse, the Bundesland I come from, in order to substantiate these arguments, but I will leave it at that and 
to, sh to, to, to underline my argument that a regionally um, based study of economic development may let us lot, may let us know a lot more about globalizing and deglobalizing factors and effects instead of talking about the economy, the national economy. Let me come to my third and last argument in this context. Uh, a plea for a more polycentric perspective uh, while including other factors next to the economic, social or political ones. Although economic history is indispensable, as all of us know, when discussing parallel processes of globalization and deglobalization, it would be, of course, wrong to assign a monopoly to, these, to this field of study. The discussion on the emergence or the re-emergence of multiculturalism in Europe can illustrate this relationship. Interestingly enough, dealing with this phenomenon can help us to better understand the slow fermentation of a kind of mental deglobalization in different sections of in different countries of Europe of the population as a long time before the speed of economic globalization decreased. What does this mean? When it first became apparent in the 1960s that most non-European immigrants and their families were settling permanently in their host countries, debates cropped up about assimilation and integration of ethnically diverse neighborhoods, discussions which still are going on. In all the societies concerned, a divide opened up between two major positions. On one side, or one side advocated the idea of an ethical revolution. Its supporters essentially demanded that a more liberal line should be followed in admitting foreign labor migrants, increasingly also refugees. In opposition to these views, a growing protest against the ideas of multiculturalism had also been building up in the same phase, and I'm talking about the era since the 1960s. Initially, the leaders of the new nationalist parties in particular, just have a look at France, but also England and other countries, these leaders formulated radical demands coupled with xenophobic slogans. Behind this, a much broader social unease emerged about the supposed un uh, unarmed invasion, as Godfrey Alton has termed it, of societies that saw their national identity endangered. Thus, and this is my argument, Europe's post-colonial heritage shows many facets since the 1970s that can be localized regionally. To this date, numerous ethnologists and a lot less historians, Elizabeth Bittner, in her wonderful book on Europe after empire, have launched projects of this type. They show, on the one hand, how the immigrants brought formative influences from their societies of origins to their host countries. On the other hand, they delineate the channels, or the channels along which immigrants increasingly adapted themselves to the reigning social and cultural institution and practices of their host countries. This mutual exchange led to a variety of consequences in both directions and across European borders. It includes, for example, the spread of new types of music and the associated youth cultures. It also propelled forward a self-confident public commitment to cultural diversity. In 1981, La Droit à la Différence uh, was uh, one of the major uh, political programs by, by the new government uh, under the rule of Mitterrand. At the same time, however, we shouldn't overlook the fact that many of these social and cultural transformations remain confined to urban spaces. And this was the case for a long time. It took the introduction of the internet in the mid 1990s before the set processes began to filter massively into the provinces of Europe. This constellation called forth many variants of localization, but also arising social protests on the part of those segments of the population which experienced the transformations as a loss of their own culture. Now, I've chosen this example in order to highlight what it means to talk about the dialectics of globalization and deglobalization, both in economic terms and, this was my last example, in cultural terms. And what we now need to do is to sort of integrate these different approaches also including, of course, political dimensions, in order to write sophisticated studies of connectivity, interconnectivity, 
this connectivity, but also of globalization and deglobalization. This, of course, there are many studies who are exactly going into this direction, and I'm not saying that there's nothing uh, uh, that, that the literature is there's a complete lack of literature in this respect. But um, in my own study on the history of Europe as a world region, I experienced the fact when we start looking a lot more closely at regional, interregional um, connections, the whole thing gets a lot more difficult. And I refrain from saying that history has already done its job. I think we are right at the beginning or in the middle of it. And what I, I, what I try to argue is to do it a bit more in a sophisticated way in order to get down to the realities of life of the people in the regions. Of different world regions. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks also to Christoph Cornelissen for this further con critical contribution on the potential pitfalls of uh, global history perspectives and on also on the semantic or the importance of considering the semantic dimension of uh, globalization and deglobalization, which raised many questions concerning the relationship between Europeanization and periodization, uh, Europeanization processes and the discur discursive dimension of this process. But now we have, uh, I think, uh, 10 minutes for our discussion and um, would like to ask all the attendees of the webinar and the participants to raise their hands to intervene if they have questions to the three three speakers of the second session. You can use. You can use also the. Roland Benzerima is still with us, but maybe we should give him the privilege to put yeah. the question if he fancies doing this because uh, he's about to jump off. And uh, <laughs> I, I was just keying this into the chat, yeah, because I, it was my farewell message basically. But I don't. I, I cannot offer. I cannot offer a question. But I, I let me say in all brevity that I could not agree more with your call to to look at this. You know, in, in much more detail, maybe in regional settings, that is your particular idea, basically. But um, I would add, maybe focused on really the individual actors or groups of actors, um, focused on very particular problems. And I think that is precisely, as you say, that's precisely the, the way to move forward. So I cannot really offer a critical question much as I would like to, but I'm all in agreement, which is which is probably nice personally, but not so good for, uh, <laughs> you know, getting the discussion going, <laughs> of course. Yeah, I, I really, and that would be my kind of slide out message. I really look forward to continuing this uh, conversation, um, maybe in Trento, maybe in Munich, or maybe in Trento and in Munich at some at some time. And many thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay. Many thanks for joining us, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, um, I think um, when I've, I've had a close look at your introduction, wonderful introduction to the history of uh, connectivity and disconnectivity. And uh, I think um, where you use these ex different examples, I think there are six of them mm -hmm. in order to approach the problem. I think that that is definitely one, one of the strategies we should be aware of in order to differentiate a lot more uh, I, I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm putting it very short a kind of hollow talk between uh, and differentiation between globalization and deglobalization and I think we, we, are, we are past this stage and we should try to oh, absolutely get down a bit more nearer to where actors as you say act literally uh, and and where maybe uh, victims suffer and and we should try to what is a classical perspective of course but uh, something with, which doesn't appear very often in in in, in let's say in, in many parts of the global global history literature no i i couldn't agree more and uh, uh i just i just hope it would be a pleasure to be part of this with all of you together yeah. well, we, we will definitely invite you and uh, hopefully we will find also other interconnecting uh, sessions where we try to deepen, deepen our arguments. And follow Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. And 
Um, no hard feelings about me dropping out a few minutes That's too fine. early. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So, are there any questions in the chat? No. no. But I have a question. Please. Sir. Kind of a question open to, to discussion. I don't know if we want to. Um, and, um, you know, thinking of where we go, where we go next and uh, where actually, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I think I'm very much, uh, uh, I very much agree with uh, Christoph Cornelison's uh, idea of uh, how we should uh, um, use history uh, to get to a more refined and specific and sophisticated way to look into reality and to the problems of today. Um, and, um, and nonetheless, um, even though, yes, if we look at the history of, uh, I, I totally agree that, you know, this idea of globalization is something that comes from, you know, a, a rather um, undifferentiated and uh, statistical consideration of, uh, of, uh, of the global economy more uh, than anything else. But there are uh, elements, policies, necessities that uh, uh, I believe uh, should lead us to think globally. And one of those is uh, the environment, right? So, and I was wondering, <clears throat> Uh, when thinking about the fact, uh, okay, it's true that if we interpret history, we have to differentiate, and, uh, and uh, it is not, uh, it is, uh, um, it, it is, it is not, uh, you know, given that we are uh, thinking of uh, globality. Uh, in very effective ways and uh, that we should be more careful and but at the same time i think that i i still i do believe that uh, you know when we study history we study history to th to look into the future too and not you know just to keep ourselves in the past and uh, and uh, and with this uh, attitude i think that you know thinking about the global environment is something that uh, uh, should involve us all, and uh, and indeed the global, and and indeed it's uh, thinking about the environment, climate change, or uh, the different the different uh, uh, um, ways to uh, to think about the, the the you know the birth of of also of the culture of uh, uh, of climate change is something that we uh, should all uh, deal with uh, more extensively sooner or later. And I was wondering uh, uh, whether uh, what, what you people uh, dealing with uh, global history think about you know the necessity. What I believe is a necessity to feature uh, the environment in our considerations of the global and uh, and. Uh, uh whether yeah what 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 do you think of that so whether this actually changes you know our uh our attitude in terms of uh, thinking about uh, history as something that uh, oh it's more regional than uh, than actually global maybe we can collect other questions i, I don't see uh, Katia Occhi and Giacomo Bonan, they just they co-edited uh, the, uh, the last issue of the special issue of the Annali was devoted to the environment history. Maybe exactly. Could provide uh, interesting insights. Um, or maybe Christoph Cornelius would like to reply to this. Um, I think uh, Dara brought up a fair suggestion, uh, which which uh, definitely has to be respected. And uh, my argument would never be to to um, to do away with global approaches uh, instead of uh, <laughs> simply confining myself to little regions, which uh, I, I attempt to uh, understand in a better way because uh, they are nearer to me. That would be a bit. Uh, 
not just unfair, that would be ridiculous. Um, of course, you're right, there are global challenges and the climate question is, of course, the most prominent one in a, in a series of, of many other gen more general problems which need literally to be tackled in, in a global way. But uh, then this brings up the question, what does that exactly mean, doing it globally? And in that context, I would continue to argue it would make sense to uh, come up with differentiations, uh, be it in a regional perspective, be it in a social perspective, that's Osterhammel's intervention, social, social hierarchies, be it also maybe a gender perspective, because not everything is regarded in the same way, be it a man, be it a woman, and so on and so forth. So this kind of differentiation, which is common in historiography and which was part of our classical upbringing, needs to be sort of integrated a lot more into new approaches of global history. I'm not saying that it hasn't been done at all, but it needs a lot more effort in this respect because um, and there are wonderful studies on global marriages and, and whatever you, you like or prefer. Uh, so the tendency is there. But when I wrote my book on Europe, I, I, I thought there's a huge lack of literature which tries to come to terms with the manifold experiences of people, not just in a regional way, but generally. And, and uh, although we have had global history with us now for two or three decades. So this is, is something which, which uh, made me a bit uh, uneasy. But of course, you're right. We, we, we need to uh, go for a global perspective, especially a perspective which includes the, pers um, the views of non-European countries or non-European people. Uh, uh, and, and this is something which we have been doing only very scarcely today. But of course, that's an obvious uh, challenge which needs to be um, uh, overcome, uh, not just in the near future, but immediately, if we really want to uh, write global history in the literal sense of the world, of the word. Okay. Maybe I have a question to Christoph Cornelis, and I was fascinated by your um, analysis of the semantic uh, dimension of globalization, the globalization. And so it, it raised the question, when did this discourse, public discourse, start in Europe about globalization? And I, I, I don't know if I understand cor correctly, you, you tend to uh deny that this started in the 70s you, you bring back the the um, or maybe i i understood correct uh, i didn't understand well you find instances uh of, of use of the word globalization as early as the 1960s but very few only and this this starts to become a lot more in the 1970s but it is nothing compared to the 1990s and and the period thereafter so um, this is the the real breakthrough uh, is, is de definitely towards the end of the 20th century. If you if you measure this according to the parameters of of the internet uh, or the titles of um, library catalogs, I mean it's quite easy to do that, and uh, you, you see these rising curves uh, and 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 the ups and downs. But the 1990s represent the decade in which the whole thing. Uh, um, really um, developed into a, a massive wave. And and the deglobalization is a lot later, a lot, several years later, as we know. And and uh, we, we are now, since the financial crisis, um, experts, as they call themselves, or as they are used to be called by their even opponents, began to start about deglobalization. And this is where we are. Um, and my, my, my idea would be to look a lot more precisely at the fields where these words come from, where these terms come from. And uh, interestingly enough, I've, I've looked at a lot of this management literature. Yeah, you mentioned uh, management, economic, but you didn't mention uh, communication. I was quite surprised. Okay. Um, it, it's not a complete list, that's right. Uh, but uh, the, the, the let's say, the, the, the main source okay. for um, these discussions, which we tend to follow up quite uncritically, can be uh, located in the field of economics and above all management literature. And there are 
waves of titles, waves, huge waves of titles, which spring up and which tend to explain to managers what are the right strategies in order to be economically successful. And deglobalization seems to be the new buzzword, as I say. Thank you. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Okay. Well, maybe uh, we've already passed our uh, timeline, which we um, Fine. have foreseen for today's um, um, first round of discussion. Maybe we can come to a close here by saying, first of all, thank you to all the speakers, Sarah, and all the other speakers. Uh, I think uh, it was quite a, a useful, from my point of view, first reflection, round of reflection on the general problems which all of us um, are confronted, being confronted with when we start or try to write some kind of global history, whatever that in reality means. Uh, and for that reason, I'm sure um, there's loads of time and place where, and, and also okay, there will be occasions, and this is something which I wanted uh, to um, let you know right now, is that we are planning to uh, our our Settimana di Studi, uh, as I said today, in September 2020, exactly on the same problem, but with a lot more muse, with a lot more time, with a lot more time for reflection, a lot more time for debates, and of course also other speakers, which who will hopefully add us to understand the problem in a more or even more sophisticated form. But that doesn't mean that. Our first attempt wasn't successful. In my view, uh, we have tried to, to do our best, all of us, in order to get to the problem, to the core of the problem. And this is uh, what uh, academics can do, uh, after all, and need to do a lot more when discussing global history. 